Right, ladies and gentlemen, um, this here is why we have hosepipe bands. It's got nothing to do with the weather or climate change. It's this. This is gonna take probably about a month to fix. Hospital port is pride and dignity. Stop the new world order. Welcome to Panwo TV. I'm actually at the station, you see. I'm at uh, Oxford Station. I'm going on another adventure. I'm going to Bath. Now, I've not been to Bath for a long time. It was actually 2011, I believe, the ASAP Seriously Strange conference. I'll put a link in the description box to my reportage at that time. Now, guess what? <coughs> I'm going back to the very same event. <laughs> 11 years later, I'm going back to the ASAP Seriously Strange conference. Let me just show you. And this is the conference I'm going to. Um, it is the uh, Association for the Scientific Study of Anomalous Phenomena, Seriously Strange. It's a good name, isn't it? Yeah, it's always seriously something. I was seriously the conspiracy theory one I spoke at was called con seriously suspicious. I remember. And uh, this is a great conference in Bath, UK, and it's I went to it in 2011. And if you actually go to the link in the description box, you'll see my reportage from that. What was years ago? And back again for a new one. It's the 40th anniversary of ASAP. Speakers include Dr. Anne Winsper. Now, um, she's featured several times on her Panmo TV because I've seen her at a number of conferences now. Steve Parsons, Jack Hunter, Richard Freeman, a great charismatic cryptozoologist, CJ Romer, um, Dylan Jones. And I don't know who most of these people are, actually, but... Um, I'll learn. I'll, I'll learn to this particular event, won't I? Reverend Lionel Fanthorpe, who's a lovely old chap, he is. He's a great guy. I interviewed him. There's Dr. Ursula Wolski, John Fraser, David Saunderson, and Professor Chris French. The evidence, the evidence. Now, French is good. He's a skeptic, but he's a good skeptic because, like, um, he's really nice. And he actually, he was, it was he who invited me to speak at the ASAP Seriously Suspicious Conference. So it's really good. He's going to be there. And, um, Christian Lander, I know because I've interviewed him twice, uh, most recently about this particular event on her Panwo radio. So it looks really good. There's a lot coming up. I'm going to be in Bath, of course. So I'm going to do a tour of the city, um, go to the Roman Baths and everything, and um, maybe show you a bit more of the city I'm planning to do. It's a lovely venue, lovely city. The venue itself is all right. The catering has a lot to be desired, and there's no pub for about 500 miles, it feels like. So, Miles Johnston, that's another reason not to go. So, uh, if you care to accompany me, we shall head to Bath now. Well, guys, um, this is Didcot Parkway. There we are, see, Did Didcot, or Deadcock Parkway, as I called it last time I was here. Got all, all everything from the original is coming back, actually, everything from the original video I did. It's sort of returning to me. Um, this is actually a rather depressing place. It has a bad atmosphere. Uh, there's high-speed trains often come through here. There's no sort of relay for them to go around and they give you quite a shock when they come past this platform at top speed. Um, there's a railway museum here which you might find interesting. Um, it's an old-fashioned type station. It has never been sort of renovated which I think is why they um, this was actually used in the filming of Anna Karenina. Um, it's an, a film ad adapted from a Leo Tolstoy novel. They thought that this looks very much like a 19th century Russian railway station. It is, they, they sort of like tarted it up a bit to look, make it look more Russian, you know, but apart from that, it's very much, it's pretty much authentic, you know, that is one good thing about it. It's a depressing story, actually. It's about a woman, she, she witnesses a railway accident in which a man gets killed and she ends up throwing herself in front of a train. It's pretty grim. But uh, I'm not seeing that movie, I've seen the older version. But anyway, just waiting now. It's, it's all going quite quick, it's only about five minutes and the train, the next train is going to arrive. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna head off there soon. Look at that, eh? The Bath MBA. 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 MBA, yeah, look at that bravery there. Well done, mate, well done. Slap your back, mate. Slap your back. It's uh, actually been quite a quick journey. I'm on the second stage now, and I'm pretty soon going to be arriving at Bath Spa, Bath Central Station. Um, so I've got on a very appropriate t shirt there, I think. Freemium sources. Perfect thing, I think. And uh, I've got a good book to read as well. Another real life 
my story. It's a George Clancy one. Okay, I've, I've arrived. This is the station Bath Spa. As you can see, it's a lovely oldie worldy station. And um, I'm basically at the same place I was 11 years ago when I watched the video, you'll see. Um, my impression is it hasn't changed at all. It's an old place. And the first impression you get is everything's made of this particular coloured stone, kind of like uh, Cotswold limestone. You actually see the same thing in Oxford, used to a lesser degree in architecture. And um, this place does have a, a, it does have a truly warm energy to it. I detected that when I came here in 2011 and I detect it again coming back. Um, just gonna look at this over here. There's like a little Aquasulis Royal Crescent Thermo Bath Spa. All right, this is back in the moon out. This is the, the tourist attraction, the Roman Baths, Green Park, Grand Pump Room, Jane Austen, Royal Victoria Park. Yeah. Now, um, I know some of you watched the Crafty Nihilist. They've just done a They've just done a, a video about the Royal Crescent. I don't know if I'll have time to go and visit that. First place I want to go, of course, is I'm going to go, of course, to the Roman Bath so I can uh, have, you know, go and have a look around. That's always the biggest attraction, have a Boudicca moment, that sort of thing. Uh, but um, maybe we'll have time to see some more things. I'll show you, you see, this is the map of the city here. And that there is the Royal Crescent. Um, and there's a, that's the circus, yeah, that's, that is the circus. Royal Crescent, where are we? I'm here. Right, I want to get to the Roman Baths, which is, oh, where's that? Roman Baths and Pump Room, right, it's not far from here. I'll be able to find it quite easily, so I might just take a photograph of this to guide me. This is interesting, because this is like a smaller version of the Big Bath. It's like a, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if this is an original or a Roman building. It's, it looks too new for that, but, um, if you look in here, this is all, of course, reproduction, but uh, you can pause and read that if you can see it. But it gives you all the details here. It says, the sanctuary is truly unique, a grade one listed building, scheduled ancient monument, official sacred site of the, the council worship there, making their offerings to Sulis, they call this, Roman public bathhouse here. Uh, name was from cross bearing pillars. It can be hard for exclusive use for up to 10 people. Sounds very romantic, doesn't it? Whoops. Let's go back. The Cross Spring. This is another, it's hot again, it's a heated spring. You can read, pause and read that. There we go. Yeah, it's, um, it's basically a little version, a smaller version of what we're about to see. And here we are, we're at the Roman Baths. Wait for it, wait for it. Let's go in there and have a look around first, shall we? This is the, the, the main entrance. I've got, now I've got this here, which is like a little tour, but it's like a audio automatic tour. You just put it up to your ear like that and press a button and you can, uh, it gives you information about what you want to know, so that's great. It's a different time I remember it, actually. I don't remember this bit from last time. Anyway, as you can see here, there's like an upper, there's an upper part and then we're gonna, and there's an arrow, you've got to follow an arrow, but you can like pause and read that by all means. There you go. Um, the Roman Baths, World Heritage Site. See, and there's a lot of neoclassical architecture here. These statues, for example, the archway over there. Now that's actually not, that's actually not original Roman. That's more, that's much more recent. The, the, basically everything above like four, everything above four feet from the water surface is Roman. Everything above that is more recent construction. Mm, so you can pause and read that. This image here gives you kind of a scale of, gives you an idea of the scale of the original building, which would have been a spectacular sight. That's where we are. Now, the original ceiling was really high. It was like a massive barrel vaulted roof. This is um, whatever that is in proper measurements above the bath. Oh, uh, yeah. So you'd, be, you'd come in here and it'd have been like this huge ceiling way. The ceiling was probably taller than it needed to be. It was probably a, a shock and awe thing, I think. 
mind, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. We're gonna go down, down to the water's edge in a minute. That there's a sacred spring. That's the original down there. That's... You can see the water boiling. It looks like it's boiling. It's, uh... it's not actually boiling, it's 46 degrees. And um, it's actually, there's it's gas is trapped in there that sort of bubbles out. You can see how it works. Yeah, pause when you're down if you like, guys. Sorry. Um, that's, that's the spring, and all the water goes down into the deep, deep into the earth. It gets hot because it's very deep, thousands of feet down. It slowly like, works its way up until so it comes out. It's sort of like a, it's a bit like a benevolent version of fracking, really. Um, there was like, there's like a plinth in there, because there used to be a statue in here, so it was Minerva. But there was like, the, the, underneath, under this surface, you can't actually see it, but there is actually a, a plinth for the statue, the sacred statue of the goddess. Okay. That's what it looked like. There's a some railroad artifacts here, look. You see, there's a water, there's a water channel. Ghost, you can see a plant over there. There'd have been no, um, there'd have been no swimming in that sacred pool. That was left. Them. That would have been like sacrilegious. Uh, all the swimming was done here, but the hot water all came from there. And to that other little bath we saw. There's another model around. That's what it would look like. You see the inside of it there. And that's, that's what we're looking at there. Sorry. That's that over there. That's an early Roman town of bath. See, that's the that's the bath there. I can see the You can feel the warmth coming off it. That's the uh, sacred spring overflow. That's actually. Uh, you can feel the warmth coming off that water. There's actually, I don't know if you could see the steam there, but I could feel the steam coming off it. And it's uh, not boiling, but it's really hot. And um, there's something underneath here. Look, there's some more of it. There's some more of that hot water. Yeah, look, there's some more of that hot water. That's how they built it, look. Re-roofing the baths. In fact, there's some, we can actually see some original stonework here. Bread. That's something would have done it on the builders. And here is the actual bath itself, the, the main bath. Now, see, but it's actually like a swimming pool. It's not like what we would think of as a bath. Here's some bits here, this little bench where people used to sit. It's like, I think the anything above for anything above sort of this sort of level is not original without obviously this this bit around the, the, the terrace itself is not original but this is all original here look you see there's a culvert here see channel should channel the water down here maybe that used for drainage but you can see that water coming out of there and there's this you can see the steps people used to get down into it is actually very, yeah, it's really, it's very like a modern swimming pool. It is amazing what they, I mean, quite something, actually. Quite, quite, quite a, and there's lead, apparently, the, it's waterproof with, with lead sheets. The people behind me, actually, are sitting pretty much where the Romans would have sat. Um, obviously, that's a modern bench, but there's been a stone, you've seen the stone benches already. 
Yeah, it's, a, it's quite something. It's quite something to behold. There you are. I can tell, prove I've been here. It is me. Now this is part of the original roof. See, there's some more of it there, see? Box columns reminds you of something, doesn't it? These thin, these thin kind of bricks are very Roman. This is how, if you go to Megalithomania, they explain how these are often built upon much larger, more ancient stones. <coughs> well, the pigeons like it, obviously. I think they must like the warmth. But this is the actual, uh, where the water supply comes through. You see the chemical, it's stained by the chemicals in the water. Apparently drinking the water is supposed to be good for you. Look at that as an old, that is an old Roman water pipe. The Romans, the Romans used to make all their water pipes out of lead because, of course, they hadn't discovered the beneficial properties of fluoride yet, had they? <laughs> I'm on the other side of the bath now. That's where I came in. And this here is like it's the East Bath. This is called. Um, I can't remember if this is this the cold plunge. But they used to have like a little animated thing on there. But um. People have been throwing coins in there. I don't know if it is a wishing well, but uh, this might have been the... Let's have a look and have a listen to what it is. 96. Ah, it is the cold plunge, right. Yeah, what, what they do is, <laughs> yeah, what it was is, um, somewhere now, I'll show you in a minute, is there's, there's like a sauna, and um, I think it's in here, yeah, it's, a, it's the hypercourse sauna, and um, the door is in the, the, the circular cold plunge pool with the rest of the western range of parts. You can see that was basically where they had the fire, because those pillars. You, you actually, we actually saw this, didn't we, in Newbury, do you remember? And this would basically be, this, this wouldn't be the floor, this would be under the floor, there'd be a fire burning here, and there'd be a hot, there'd be a floor above it, which was hot, and, it, and you, they, people used to, they used to throw water on it, which turned into steam, it would make a sauna. And so after you've been in the sauna for a while, the next stage was to come straight from the sauna, jump into the cold water. <laughs> Sounds like torture to me, but apparently they thought it was good for you. You see, we've got very Roman ghosts. <laughs> Just like that story of that guy who saw the, the ghost come through the wall, but no, they're actually projected. And there's, you see some ball game they're playing. One thing that's actually uh, less accurate, you see weightlifting here. Now one thing that's slightly less accurate, from what I gather is, the bathing costumes. In those days, you just, you just went in billy bollocks. Of course, you can't show that, you can't put that in these images, can you? Not in today's modern prudish times. Here's an image of how the sauna worked. You have this fire here, and the, the fire didn't actually burn under the floor. I got that wrong. But the hot air would come through, and you'd have like this very hot room here, and there'd be, there'd be steam. It was a sauna, basically. And uh, there's the guys again. Uh, again, they've got their bathing, they've got their little bathing costumes. Swing trunks on, which they wouldn't have normally, but um, you do that just sit in the sauna for a while and go to the, the cold the cold plunge. Spooky and dark in here, and there's uh, some more. This is what it would have been like, well, again, without the togas. And this is the east bath, I believe. I don't know what you can see about this, it's all dark in here. But uh, I think this is called the East Bath. And you can see here that this is another part of the, oh, the, the projection's gone now. So there's a projection on the screen here. Um, it was actually showing people, I'll let you know if it comes back, I'll let you know. But it was actually showing people um, having a massage. And there'd be like uh, um, massage tables and a masseuse or mas uh, masseur. And they'd have massage and they'd just scrape their skin with this metal tool to get all the dirt off and um, 
I've actually seen the tool they use, it's a bit like a gardening tool almost, but they, they rub it across your skin. It doesn't sound very comfortable to me, but uh, apparently he's like that. And, uh, this is right next to the east bath. You can see how old this floor is, there's um, these flagstones on the floor, it's very bumpy, you can use a triple on here actually. Um, but of course at the time, 2,000 years ago, um, this would have been smooth, it would be like polished smooth surface, very comfortable on the feet. So I think, I'm, I don't know how much of, more, oh, I've got to see, there's, there's, there's a bit more I've got to see, because there's a, I'll show you the statue, I don't know if I can find it. Okay, get a much better view here of the sacred spring. These, these, al these alcoves above, these little cubby holes, that's actually an 18th century, um, that's actually from the 18th century. They used to have seats in there, and the water level used to be much higher. It used to come up to where those, you see where the brown bit is, and you can sit there, and there's heat, apparently healing properties in the waters. People believed in that, even like in the, in the 18th century. But there'd have been no swimming in here in Roman times. This was, this water was sacred to the goddess. What you could do is you could throw messages in you write down a message for the, it's like a prayer and you throw it into the spring pet to petition the goddess Sulis Minerva and um, apparently there's um it's very interesting because these prayer cards well, they were actually written on like bits of bone or bits of wood or, they're actually um, one of the few samples of the, the Celtic language that was spoken in Britain at the time it's actually an ancestor of Welsh and Gaelic see the bubbles there of the gas escaping it's not quite it's not boiling though it's, it's very, it is very warm be a nice little warm bath as well if you've got in if you've got in there it would feel like a warm bath which of course it was which of course it is up there's the pump room and the restaurant where you can have a meal and even, even drink some of this water i've, I've actually tasted the water it's, it's foul it's sulfurous uh, it used to be, it's considered to be healthy but uh i don't know I, it's such horrible stuff. This lady here, is it? Oh Roman lady there. Are you a real Roman lady? I am. I'm Lady Flavia. Oh, nice to meet you. My name is Ben. Not a very Roman name. Salve, Ben. <laughs> Salve. Is that the word? Oh, I like Salve, it. Welcome. Oh, welcome, thanks. Nice so, to see you. Are you, you going in for your bath as well? Um, if I, I might be a bit embarrassed taking all my clothes off. I'm used to wearing swimming trunks. Trunks? Yeah. Never heard of those. I know, I know. I, 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 yes, I, I feel like it might be a bit difficult to watch. Yeah, I know. I know you're not supposed to do that around here, are you? Everyone does. We're all just humans, aren't we? Just go in and it'll come up to about here on me. Oh, So, you know, just wander around. It looks lovely and warm. Talk to the business people. It's lovely and warm. Yeah. I was going to body temperature, really. I could stay in for hours. Oh, yeah. So, so I thought I might, I might go for a massage. I wish other swimming pools were that warm. Whether you'd get very sweaty. Listen, my freezing, freezing cold. Yes. <laughs> Fine. Have you been in the Lutetia over there? I've had a look in there. Yeah, it looks interesting. It's, so. it's, that's a bit cooler for a swim. Yeah. It's a bit more intense. I've done one of going to the, uh, the sauna and the hyper course. That must have been quite an experience. <laughs> Going into the sauna and then jumping straight, okay. going into the sauna and the hypercourse and then jumping straight into the cold plunge. Oh, yes, I, I do love the frigidaire. <laughs> yes, we've gone just through that way, so do, do check that out. Oh, thank you very much. It's lovely to see you. You Vale. Too. Sal Salve. Vale. Vale. Is that goodbye? Yes. Goodbye. Yes. All, right. all right. Thank you. Now we know what that bloke saw going through those walls all those years ago. Remember? In the cellar. That there is where. This segment fits into the arch. Okay, I just come out. Uh, well, you know what's coming next, don't you? There's a charming atmosphere here, you know? Um, there's a guy over there trumpet and there's a guy over there with a trumpet playing Moon River and there's people of all kinds walking around me and the street is it's not an authentic Roman street you know the architecture like is neoclassical you could take someone from Rome and you could plonk them here and they'd 
you just dump them here and they, they would feel slightly at home. They would recognize some of the, the things here. They're from someone who lived in Bath, Aquasulis, 1900 years ago. The people today are the products of their past. They are a creation of everything that came before them. And that includes the Illuminati influence. I mean, the the the, the influence of what or the modern man is essentially a, partly a creation of the Illuminati. And that creation began in various different places around the world. It began probably after the fall of Atlantis with the rise of the, the first Illuminati civilizations in Sumer and ancient Egypt, but. In Britain, it really started with the Roman conquest. It was not a long period. I mean, 400 years nearly. It's, it's it was not too long, but it, there's never been. I mean, people argue about whether the Anglo-Saxons were Illuminati or whether they were like this was a regression, to the rise of Anglo-Saxon culture, which is, which is not a pe the Anglo-Saxons, contrary to popular belief, was not a migration of people. It, it wasn't immigration into the into the Britain from the continent, it was a cultural revolution among the native people here. The DNA tests in Anglo-Saxon villages have proved this. Um, but either way, what I've just seen, everything I've just seen, as, as wondrous as it is, it's a symbol of that. It's a symbol of that imposition. It's a symbol of that. It, it came, it's built upon with its, all its craftsmanship, which, which both local talents and the Roman occupiers both contributed to. It's built upon the rocks of Britannia and the, 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 the porous, the porous water channels which come from thousands of feet below the earth, bringing hot water up into this area. This is the only place in the country you have hot springs like this. Other countries like Iceland have them everywhere, but Britain is quite rare. It brought that water up. The water, it's, it's buried on a pile, a mountain of dead bodies. The Boudicca Rebellion, and everyone else who even suggested that, that we, should, we should return to pre-Illuminati times. It was interesting, the, the, the geology, there's one of the, one of the on that little instrument I was holding, they talk about the geology. Um, that actually said, you know, uh, so the water, it fell as the water sinks down to the, down to the, underneath and then it comes up. Uh, it comes, it, it circulates up. Um, and that process can take over 10,000 years. Well, the water we see coming up and pouring through the, this facility today, it fell onto a very different world to what it's come up. To what has come up from now you may have heard you know water has memory masaru emoto things like that so i wonder what memory that water carries as it's returned to the surface of the earth an earth that is barely recognizable to the one it used to be that's what that's what makes the Boudicca rebellion all the more poignant today i think Okay guys, I'm at the circus. This is a, a circular street. Now if you watch Crafty Nihilist, and I know a lot of you do, you've probably seen this on their video. I must say, I've not watched all their video yet, so uh, I mean, there may be some information on that I'm not aware of, but uh, they were doing an analysis on some of the occult symbolism you see around here. This is very grand along here. Um, it's a completely circular, completely circular st street here, hence the name Circus. And, um, these buildings here look kind of like, you see this, they're, they're built that same kind of stone, that sort of cotton of limestone. Um, and these are clearly like residential houses. Very big, look, they've got like basements as well. Oh, I don't know who lives here. 
Mm. And Graham Hancock lives in Bath. I, don't, I doubt if he lives around here. It doesn't look like his sort of style, really. But uh, these are probably like the townhouses in London, you know. Um, lots of, uh, what's the word? Lots of like businesses, private doctors, things like that, embassies. Look at the acorns up there. So you see the acorns? Acorns everywhere. That's interesting, isn't it? Considering, you know, the druid groves are supposed to consist of oaks. Well, we have acorns. Let's have a look around here. Uh, Brook Street Clinic, you see, probably a lot of private hospitals, these. These are. I wonder if they're looking for porters. Just kidding. Just kidding. I don't want to be a hospital porter anymore. Uh, okay, so we'll just go on to the next point of interest. I don't know if I'll walk all the way around here. Um, I might have to just walk around just to see if I pick up any energies. Right, I'm in the middle of the, this copse of trees. Now, they're, they're not oaks, I was surprised to find. They're maples. Um, but the, the, there's the remains of some kind of structure below us here. Probably a crashed UFO. No, you're kidding. Mixed in with tree roots. And um, this is quite a, it's a lovely spot. So it, it's, it is like a slightly druidic. By the way, um, I was right. I was right about. I was right about these structures here. They are private hospitals for the most part. I'm now going to head for the Royal Crescent, the most famous street in Bath. Apparently, there's a Royal Crescent Museum. You can pause and read that. Georgian style houses through film and immersive experience. All right, and this is the Royal Crescent. I'm approaching it now. I've not been here before, incidentally. Um, but here's a here's a little plan of the houses there. See, that's what they're like. Hmm. So that's number one Royal Crescent. Oh, right. That's just one of the number one Royal Crescent. Um, but the Duke of York, the second one now. It's very hilly around here. Bath is a, is a hilly place. And uh, this Royal Crescent is slightly on a place with a good view, actually. You can see it has a nice view. It's probably why it was one of the reasons it was built here. All right. Now, one of these. I wonder if these are all private hospitals as well. I noticed in the in the crescent in the circus it was all private hospitals. So it is, I guess, right. It was like Harley Street in London. I don't know if it, it must be expensive to live here. These are probably not. Probably these are just like businesses or hospitals and things. And so, what's the crafty nihilist video anyway, where they they go around here and they analyse everything. They spot all the symbolism and stuff. This is probably, I don't know. I'll live in one of these houses in the post-Illuminati world. No, I won't. <laughs> I'm quite happy to stay where I am in the post-Illuminati world. Um, it's called Royal. So I wonder, wonder what member of the Royal family lived here. All right, guys, this is, this is a very blokey moment now, a very laddish sort of piece of interest here. This is a brand new, nice new Rolls Royce here, very pleasant. Look at the gold on that, man. Look at that, look at it in there. It looks very grand, doesn't it? Oh, <laughs> better get up to I don't think that's going to bother them much. You go along here, and there's an older roller. This, I don't know what Rolls Royce this is, What's what model. Should, should, some people could tell me more, but it's, it's, it's K Reg. But it's still very nice. Very grand in there. Lovely panel, wood panel dash. The traditional badge, radiator, very nice. Hello everyone, I'm in a pub, it's called The Lamb and the Lion, and I'm with none other than Mark Crafty. Hello, pleased to meet everybody. It's a pleasure to see Ben on our home territory of Bath. Yeah. <laughs> it's, nice to be, it's nice to be back for the first time in years. Now we're approaching a pub called The Raven. Now this is famous or infamous, isn't it Mark? It is indeed. What yeah. happened there? The land of Rod Humphreys famously confronted Keir Starmer for his... Uh, well, hypocrisy and uh, betrayal of, of people. Um, and get out of my pub! Yay! Well, yeah. this is wicked. This is, I, I didn't realise that. I mean, I knew that this happened with Kirsty and I was so pleased that it happened. But I didn't realise this was the pub. So we're going to go in there now and have a drink. Yeah. 
Fantastic. This is the place, ladies and gentlemen, where a horrible, greasy hair, grey haired piece of shit was thrown out into the street like a piece of. like the idiot he deserves to be, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're having a drink at the Raven. Uh, this is this is a new breed, uh, cider here. It's, it's actually called Keir Starmer's Tears. <laughs> and I'm having, I'm, I'm, drink, I'm drinking great big gulps of that. And Mark is here, of course, but also so is Liz, the other half of the Cry of the Nihilist. I had so, the loud, sweary half. <laughs> <laughs> Have you told him the story about the boss of this place? Oh, yes, no. Uh, we is are, that on the camera? We, yeah, yeah we, we've camera. been talking about that. It's, it's, this pub is famous now for, all, I, I suggest all distant people come here and have a drink because it's just perfect because they kick out a horrible greasy hair grey haired little slimy git they got kicked <laughs> out onto the street like the worthless bum that he is there's video footage of it all over the place. yeah oh yeah look it up it's hilarious yeah definitely i didn't realize your mark told me that this was the pub so i'm glad to be here ladies and gentlemen this is monkton farley and it looks exactly like the name sounds there's people with six fingers on their hands you can smell that shit in the air and after a couple of hours we won't even notice it but it's so charming. I'm surprised this place hasn't got a thatch roof. It literally, it literally is like, it was really beautiful. It's beautiful. There's this stone everywhere. Stone buildings, really old stuff. I've got a grabbing bag. And, uh, thanks, mate. Cheers. Um, so this is where we are. This is where we're staying. Perfect. And this is where we're staying, ladies and gents. Look at these windows. Look at, look at this. is just so lovely and oldie world. You've got like all sorts of things. We've got like, oh, what's in this fridge? This is a mini bar. We've got plenty. We've got oh, oh, some water, just water. I was expecting little bottles of brandy and vodka. Mind. We've got tea and coffee, and there's the TV. And we've got our own little lounge. Have a look at this. We literally have a small lounge with a TV set and some weird photo of painting there, which has been scrubbed out. I'm just going to show you the bathroom. No, oh, look at this. It's got a bath with little feet on it. That's how old this is, man. And there's a shower too. This is lovely. This is gorgeous. Perfect, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. You know, this is. I'm very much looking forward to staying here. I've got to stay here for two nights. <laughs> Believe it or not, this used to be a fun place. Little <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. Crashing, <laughs> crashing down. Yeah. <laughs> this has been apparently it's been building work here. This was just uncovered. It's a giant fireplace. Yes. In this lovely old pub I'm in. Personally, I think that's where they burnt the missionaries. <laughs> this is the front of the pub here, and you see it's got like another beer garden here. The King's Arms here in somewhere, you know, we don't know where it is, sort of place. And then, um, look at that. Monkton Farley, that's it. I'm going to add. Monkton Farley. For those of you who want to reference yourself, that's just outside Bradford on Avon. Where the hell's Bradford and Avon? Exactly. It's like halfway between, it's right on the border, I think, between Wiltshire and Somerset. That's right, yeah. You take one step this way, and people have seven fingers on their hands, and there's six. It's offensive, Sorry. There we are. Look at that. It's lovely, isn't it? Look at that. It's like, it's not like ivy, it's like a tree has grown there. Yeah. Mm. And look, it's like the actual doorway to the pub is like a church doorway. It's really amazing. It's got like these little. <clears throat> These little benches. Look at that. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's Saturday morning. It's about it's about just quarter past seven, and there's really thick fog here over the fields. I've not seen anything like that for ages. I'm just up with this fire escape here at the top of the at the King's Arms, which is where this is this building here, which is where there's lots of lovely. This is this lovely building here. Look at the ivy there. And look at that out there. You can, you can, I'll show you a bit more from this window, actually. You can see a bit more. You know, we're in the King's Room, apparently. Um, here we are. This is called the King's Room. Let's make sure my friends aren't in chat. Um, look out, look out there. You can see more from here. Look at the fog out there. Yeah. This is, this is like, I haven't used the lounge area yet, but um, so you can have a good morning tea, I think, and then and get, and maybe find a way, try and find a way to get breakfast. Because if I remember it in 2011, the catering facilities at the university weren't that good, uh, which is where the, the event's being held. So, um, 
may, they maybe they put on a special, maybe it's changed, I don't know. But anyway, um, yeah, I've just slept. Sorry about that, again, everybody. I was actually um, the, the alarm went off on my phone, so that's it immediately stopped the camera. Yeah, um, where was I? Yeah, it's uh, we're gonna. They may put on a special, may may improve the menu since we were there last time. Yeah, that was that was eleven years ago. Let's face it. Um, but I just slept incredibly well. I've had I've had the best sleep I've had in months. So God, I really really feel good. Oh, relax. And the bed, I mean, it's only like a, it's like a put you up, but it's, there's, um, you sh I showed you yesterday, there's the big double bed, which the Alan and Michael are in, and I've got the little put you up, but it's like, it's actually, um, quite nice. It's got a little bit of a lump in the middle where the rock, where one of the metal bits goes across, but I've got used to that. Yeah. I, I've just slept since I went to bed. We were in bed before 11 o'clock and I've only just woken up. And I got up a couple of times in the night to go to the loo, like I always do, but basically I slept really well, so. Here we are from Misty, Moncton Farley. Mm. Oh, good morning, everyone. The fog has cleared a little bit. We're now in the car heading for the venue. Um, I feel a little bit, just a tiny bit nervous. Um, nothing major, it's just that Tristan Swale might be there. Now, if you've been keeping up with the gossip and the drama on Matthew Williams' channel, you'll know that Tristan Swale is a complete piece of shit and he's been, you know, and he has been for quite a long time. Um, and um, so, well, I don't want to go into, this, this isn't a drama, my channel's not a drama channel, unlike Matthew's, but basically he turned nasty against me uh, at one point, started calling me names, calling me racist and things like that, for no reason at all. It was a completely unprovoked attack. And I, previously, I'd always got on well with him and been courteous to him. Um, he may be there, in which case, it's like, it's an Andrew Johnson situation, basically. I just have to stay out of his way. Just ignore him and stay out of his way. I'm not going to cause any trouble, you know. I'm, I, you know from when I went to Hull that, you know, I, I can prove that my presence doesn't cause trouble. So that's the thing to do. Another weird thing, I mean, I've, I've just, I've been re-watching the, the 2011 reportage of us. That's seriously strange. Um, and I'm a bit, it just, it seems to be, we're probably going to the same place and a lot of it's the same, like there's the gala dinner and the Olympics and stuff. Well, I'm not going to the gala dinner, by the way. It's, but, um, just, we're just navigating our way to, uh, to various places. So I, I think I'm putting the navigator off. Basically, uh, I lied in the previous reportage. Let me show you. Another thing is, ghosts are not always dead people. Now that is odd, isn't it? That's a big myth. Um, in fact, a lot of ghosts that are seen are actually of living people. Um, then um, there's one that's known as doppelganger. That's when you see you see you see somebody who looks exactly like you, like a mirror image. Now, um, someone's actually seen a ghost that looks like me. Um, a, a, one of my extremely proud and dignified brother porters or ex-porters now. Um, he uh, was walking through the city centre in Oxford. And he came across a man in a suit who was walking towards him. A man in a very smart suit with a briefcase. But he said, this guy looked exactly like me. He didn't just slightly look like me. He looked absolutely exactly like me. And my friend almost went up and said hello to him. Now, everyone knows that, you know, we sometimes have people who resemble us. I mean, you know, the, my resemblance to Al Murray, the pub landlord, is very well documented, you know. Um, but in this case, this guy looked exactly like me. And the only thing that stopped this bloke going up and saying hello was the fact that he was wearing a suit and he was carrying a briefcase. Now, how often do you see me dressed like that? But isn't that weird? And the, question has, the question has to be, why did I do that? But of course, it wasn't one of my brother porters or ex-brother porters who saw someone who looked like me walking through town. If you've seen the video, um, you'll know that it was me. I saw myself. I experienced my own doppelganger. So why did I lie? It's a funny thing about watching my old videos because there's things in them I don't remember, and these include things which I did, which I don't understand why I did, and that was one of them. I don't know why I didn't reveal at that point that the doppelganger sighting, it was a doppelganger sighting by me. Uh, no answer to that, unfortunately. Okay, guys, this is the Edge building 
here at the University of Bath. I think it's I think it's a different to where we were last time, based on the rewatch of the video I've just had. Anyway. This is the ASAP Seriously Strange Conference, beginning in about half an hour's time. It's an entire weekend now of non-stop, unadulterated, complete woo-woo immersion. And I'm looking forward to it enormously. Well, everybody, we're in the auditorium now, as you can see behind me. It's different from the last one. It's not a lecture theatre or such, because there's no, like, benches to write on. It's just like a more like a normal theatre. But it has, like, so it's probably used more... This is probably used more for entertainment than for... for you're giving the students lectures and stuff. But um, I've already seen a few familiar faces. I actually thought I saw someone I'd recognise it, but she wasn't them. But um, we signed in. Look, I've even got my own little name badge here, just in case I forget who I am. <laughs> so uh, that's cool. Um, we're all identified. Mark's got his on there, yep. as you can see. In case I forget who I am. Yeah, so goodness, goodness knows, we don't want that, do we? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Maybe it's not going to be that woo-woo here. But... Um, <laughs> We just got to wait now for the order for the um, thing to begin for the event to begin. We interesting. We went to the sports bar, which is the place. It's the same place we were eating last time, but uh, it, it's another pretty awful situation. Actually, apparently, Bristol Bath University is very sort of like paused, and that's no surprise actually because um, it's there's Ukrainian flags everywhere. There's a thing demanding you use hand sanitizer. And indeed, guess what? It's cashless. There we go. Anyway, I started now, so uh, I'm going to sign off for now. Hello, everyone. Right, the first session's just over. It's a different structure to most conferences. They have half-hour speaker sessions. Not very long, half an hour. Um, so we've had three speakers already. Neil Nixon, John Fraser, and uh, Stephen Palmer, I think his name is. I've made notes anyway. What I'm going to do is... Um, I'm not going to do reports now, there's no time. You've basically got 15 minutes before the next session. It's uh, it's kind of like a quite a fast schedule. I remember that from 2011, actually. So well, I'll do a deep dive on the talks afterwards. Right now, we're heading for somewhere called the Lime Tree. Um, I assume everyone knows where that is. I'm just following the others. I hope it's not the case of the blind leading the blind. But, um, yeah, interesting stuff. Um, learned a lot of things. Um, Listen to some interesting things. Listen to some bullshit as well, which I'm going to call out. Um, so, quite a lot. So, it's just the first session of the first day, but uh, there's an awful lot going on already. I'll just come out for a little bit. I'm going to need a bit of fresh air because um, um, it's, it's, it's interesting to hear about Sleepy Hollow now, but it's just it's a little bit too... Um, it's a little bit uh, too long, I think. I mean, it's, it's been like the whole session's like two hours. It's a bit much for me. So, uh, but it's been interesting so far. Um, Chris French spoke, and Winsper. Um, I'll do full breakdowns of the talks later. Um, I, I can't I don't have time to do them now. But anyway, uh, this is good. I got to speak to Frenchie, and um, I know he, he remembers me from Seriously Suspicious, and also. Um, I've got to Christian, the MC. He remembers, he, he watched the original Asset film too and he likes it, so that's really cool. See you later. All right, ladies and gents, I'm actually, oh, I just fired up again. I'm here with Liz Crafty Nihilist and his Mark. <laughs> um, we just had the panel discussion. I'll tell you more later. Oh, it's going to drop the biscuit, which Dylan knows is one of my favourite things to do, to go something. And, um, and as we were standing there, so we weren't, we weren't doing anything to kind of try and have an experience or collect evidence at that point. Um, I became aware that I could see what looked like someone standing in the doorway in the room that I was in and the room along from that. Um, and I was... ...who have come to bring me here today and look after me. Um, I'm scheduled to talk for the next few minutes about road ghosts, which are, in my book, particularly interesting. And... I do hope that you will forgive me if I have to read from my script, because uh, although I love pacing around... Right. It's the end of day one. I'm standing here. I'm, I'm actually in the airlock. <laughs> hey, there's, there's, there's Nick. And, um, yeah, I'm standing right here by this phone. And it's... Yeah, that's Christian. Hello. You say hello to my viewers, Christian. Hello. How are you doing? Yeah. That's emergency telephone ring. 
The last time I was here, I, I blogged the same thing, and I was like, "What's the chance of that?" Yeah. I mean, it's, that's, I don't believe it. I mean, that's like, like, like someone must realise the irony of that. I'm sure. Oh, great. If you want help, you ring the devil. Oh God, yeah, it's unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah. But there you go. That's the end of day one. I've had John a good time, Christian. I've actually had a really good time. Yes. Mm. I was struggling to get my back just uh, a bit too mm. much, but actually, yes, it was really good. There were so many talkers today. Mm. I really enjoyed uh, the last two talks, actually, Dylan Jones and there was a lady whose name is now escapes me. Lyle Fanthorpe. Yeah, and, and the gentleman before that, there was Dylan Jones, um, and there was yeah. Dr. Rich Ironside, that's it. Yeah, yeah I really mm. enjoyed their connected conversations. That was really interesting. It was really, really good. Yeah. You, you, mean, you know, people from Ham Pamo Radio know your voice, but you're on the Pamo TV now. <laughs> oh. what's, your, what's your website? Uh, it's uh, christianlander.com, that's Christian with a K. That's christianlander.com, or you can find my podcast. It's, I haven't been on one in a little while, it's our curious world. Mm, so uh, yeah. you can have a look at that and you'll find me pretty easy. Cool, brilliant. I've learned a lot too. I've had um, I learned a hell of a lot of information today. I've learned a lot of it and I mean some of it I some of it I really did, or knew already knew, some of it I disagreed with, some of it and I didn't agree with, some I did. But it's been an amazing day, absolutely packed, and, and we're now we gotta go relax and have dinner I think. So uh, so from the emergency telephone with its devilish demonic number. Oh, I think that's it. Everyone's now moving out now into the, um, into the, some are going to the gala dinner, I'm not, so, uh, are you going to the gala dinner? Uh, yes, I go to the gala dinner and there's like a meeting afterwards, there's going to be a contending of the talk afterwards. Hey, we'll have a good time, enjoy it. Yeah, it was actually a really nice pub actually, we were going there last night, unbeknownst that that's going to go tonight. Oh brilliant, no, nice one. Yeah. Well, uh, we're going to go to a Chinese place in town in Bath, so. You have a good time. Yeah, All right, I'm gonna. Thanks, yeah, okay, see you then. I'm now going to head for uh, to meet up with my friends. So uh, and then we're gonna head off. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going in convoy right now. I'm actually with the crafty nihilist in our car. You remember the very in interesting little segment we did on the way back from Pro a couple of years ago? Um, we're now heading for dinner, which is somewhere in Bath. And, um, it's, it's, a, it's called Peking, this Chinese restaurant, which is very politically incorrect. You're supposed to call it Beijing now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's like you're called, you're called, everything's got a new name now. It's We're like, in a convoy. Yes, yeah, so but Peking. And, and um, behind us are the, uh, the Alan and Michael and Nick the Gardener. So, yeah, or Nick the Investigator, as he's now called. So. This is, uh, we live in the university. The university is actually right on the edge of town. It's like, it's, there's not a lot around actually. So uh, catering in the university is not the best, as you know. So um, I think we're just gonna have to um, drive in until we get there. We have we have a table booked, luckily. I am, um, we're sitting in the beer garden now. Um, it's totally dark. You may be able to see me slightly, but this is a very, very nice place. That meow, that's not a cat, that's uh, Leanon's phone. It sounds like a cat. Um, now you may be able to see these trees behind me because they're slightly lit. Um, it's pit, they haven't lit the garden lights tonight so we can even do a sky watch. You won't see the moon behind me there. Um, it's a slightly better night vision than my, there's the moon, than my old camcorder. Um, but uh, it's it's lovely, there's a, there's, there's a stone wall right here and then there's an open field for miles. It's really amazing at night. It's really, there's some cows in the field, you want to see them. Um, and some big trees which are lit by the car park lights just over there, which you may be able to see. Now, um, strange thing, um, there's a strange, we heard a strange noise earlier, like a rumbling noise. I've heard it several times, I heard it last night as well. It comes from the direction of those trees over there. It's not a plane, it's not thunder. Um, it's like a oh, that kind of noise. Reminds me of those sky quakes you hear about. Um, I heard it last night as well. Don't know what it is. I don't know what's causing it. I'm, I'm not saying it's aliens, etc., etc., etc. You know what I mean. But I, I, it just, it just, I, I just don't know what's causing. It. That's what I'm saying. Can't think of an explanation. It's not a plane. It's not thunder. Don't know what it is. So I hear, if I hear it again, I'll try and film so you can hear it too. Okay, guys, the rumble has come back. I can hear it. Um, I don't, can you hear that? That's that's not wind. That's a car coming, but there's a rumble behind it. That's not a plane. There's a plane going over mine, so whether it's like the sound being displaced. Oh, because the, yeah. Uh, there's a plane, I can see the flashing lights of a plane going over, but that, 
I don't think that's it. No, it's not it. Strange. Uh, we had we had a nice um, dinner actually, and I didn't film at all. But after the end of the conference, uh, we after we admired the emergency phone with its devilish number, we went to a place called uh, Peking, or as it's called today, Beijing. You know, you're not allowed to say Peking. No, you have to say Beijing and Myanmar. And, you know, all all the old bourgeois imperialist names have gone. <coughs> but um, uh, um, we had a lovely meal. Um, and then in this, in this in this Chinese place, and then we came back to Moncton Farley, and so we're just having a couple of pints before bed. But the plane's gone over. Maybe that's what I heard. But I thought the rumble had come back. But um, the rumble is not planes, by the way. I mean, it's um, definitely not the planes. It's not a plane, ladies and gentlemen. There's a steady white light. <sighs> Bastard! I couldn't get my camera on quickly enough. There it is, see it? No, it's gone again, it's behind the clouds. It'll come out, it'll come out of the clouds it's a steady wind. No, it'll come up and look. There it is. I think it's a plane. It, it is, is only it would. It is, it's a plane. Let's see. Plane. Wait, plane. now wait and see, you're not even looking. It is. It's not flashing, is it? It is flashing and there's a red light on it, it's a plane. Where's the, it must be the landing light. Let's have a look. I'll wait till it's it's this. Yeah, I, I can see a red and green light. I think it is a plane. All right, it is a plane. Michael knew that without even turning his head. He just guessed. Isn't that incredible? I don't know if you can see it. I found my TV viewers. Uh, it's visible. But... And it's making a noise now, yes. Again, there's, sli there's, it's a sli there's a slight lead on it because the plane is ahead because the sound, of course, takes a while to travel. So. But it's, you know, if I just saw a single white light. I thought it might have been. Yes. Flashing light. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I saw it again. Yeah, you're right. There's some. There's something that sounds like lightning over there. Maybe that. That could be what's causing the rumbling. It just didn't sound like normal thunder. It doesn't mean it's not thunder. But I don't know if you saw the sheet lightning there, ladies and gentlemen, the Panorama TV viewers. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know how much you can see of this, but there's something going on in the distance behind those trees. Behind that tree. You may not see it, but there's a light beam. Stop now. There's a light beam going backwards and forwards like a lighthouse. It was just, it seemed to be projected from the ground up at the cloud cover and it was going backwards and forwards. Did you, I don't know, you may have, you may have caught it. Stop now. You may have seen it before I, before I started filming. And funnily enough, it was coming from the direction where I heard the rumbling. Again, I don't know if there's anything significant here. I really don't. I just thought that was odd. And it's from the very same direction. This reminds me of when I was in Devon. I don't know if you've seen that video. I can't remember if it's the first one or the second one, but it's like that. You know, I, ladies and gentlemen, it's, there's flashing lights over in that same direction again. And do you know what? The bastards have stopped again when they get my camera out. It's not. It's not the. It's not the beam this time. It's just like. It's almost like sheet lightning. That's something that's possible. Um, we can look, we can check that out actually. We can maybe phone them in the morning and ask them or just say, did you ever happen to have a disco on this particular evening? But it's bloody stopped now. I'm sorry, I'm sorry that it's, I haven't managed to capture it on film. It's hmm. not Yeah, it wasn't like a beam. The first, the last time was like a, literally like a lighthouse beam going backwards and forwards across the, the sky. This time it's just like sheet lightning, but there's no thunder. There was a rumbling noise earlier on from that direction, but it's stopped now, I'm only filming. So sorry, I mean, I don't know how much you'd have seen in it exactly. Anyway, this is not exactly a camera from the Wynn Keach collection. So um, I don't know how much you'd have seen anyway, but I just wanted to report that this is what I've actually detected. Hello guys, how you doing? Um, I'm actually in, this little lounge area here, it's uh, the hotel we're staying at, and I thought I'd just, now I've got a bit of peace and quiet, it's about half ten in the evening, we've been out to have dinner, had to drink, I uh, didn't see anything else strange, um, didn't see any other weird things in the sky, so I thought I'd uh, talk a little bit more about the speakers today, now, the, um, it was um, actually Christian, um, Christian was actually, his name was Christian Cromer, the uh, CJ Cromer as he's known, 
as the um, MC, the guy who, uh, he was actually a speaker in 2011. And he came on, there's a lady called Norrie Miles, who's one of the organisers. And he, he came on, he introduced the, um, he introduced everyone about what was going on. He explained about what was, about the, the background at, at ASAP. And he introduced some of the organisers, such as Norrie and several other people. Um, the uh, ASAP actually split from the SPR 40 years ago, or 41 years ago, in fact, in 1981. And um, the Scott Society of Psychical Research, I, I know exactly what the cause of that split was. I mean, that's maybe a big thing. Um, what's, is there moths in here? I hope so. There's, there's not enough moths in this world. And, um, let's see. Yeah, there are. All good. And um, he's, what he said was very interesting. He came up with an interesting one. He said, he, he was a bit dramatic. Is, the, is ASAP on the brink of irrelevance? It's like a... Oh, really? What do you mean, on the brink of irrelevance? So um, he then went on to say, well, you know, UFOs are being discussed openly in the media now in the United States and other places. Um, supposing we discover what they are, where, wherever they come from, then, well, they're no longer paranormal, are they? They're just normal. They're part of normal science. They're no longer fringe science. They're normal science. Same goes for psychical research, you know. It could come up with some real answers to what causes it and then it's no longer paranormal it's all part of psychical research and then what will we do <laughs> there'll be no more there'll be no more mysteries to solve well um yeah what about ghosts maybe we might discover what they are then there'll be no longer mysteries to solve are we on the brink of irrelevance are these things about to be solved then the first speaker was called um neil nixon now i've got mixed feelings about this guy because um he came on and explained like he completely disagreed with christian um there are plenty of, there are absolutely plenty of anomalies left. Um, and he said, um, he said that um, ASAP is not endangered, but um, there's plenty, there's, there's no shortage of anomalies. And it seems that if we solve some, we'll solve others. There are plenty of things in the past that used to be anomalies. We didn't know what caused lightning, for example. Lightning, thunder and lightning. We put it down to gods originally. Then it was like paranormal. It was, it was in the field of the paranormal. You know, it was all sorts of mystical forces were suggested to what caused it. Then we found out it was just electricity. It was just an electrical effect. <laughs> Ironically, since then, people like Dr. Judy Wood have come out and said, well, maybe there is something more to it. Uh, you know, cause, uh, and, but there you go. And that's, that's how science works. Science and fringe science and other things don't. You know, you go through phases where things are solved, then there's new mysteries and those get solved. And then suddenly things you were things that were solved then suddenly turn out not to be solved and things like that. Oh, that's just normal. That's just normal. And then um then he said he started, he said we need critical thinking skills in this world. And he started talking like some a lot of people I know within the fourteen world actually. They start talking, well, you know, we're the lone voices in the wilderness of rationality and we're crying, we're the lone voices of rationality crying out in the wilderness of naivety and gullibility and things like that. And his tone started to annoy me a bit. You know, I know a lot of people like this. Um, it's, I sometimes think these people should just go, you know, just go to the sceptic events then. It's like, you get like UFO groups and paranormal groups and they have their one token sort of person who's like a, um, a skeptic in all but name. You know what I mean? That kind of individual. So um, I'm, I'm not in favour of critical thinking skills, you know. We, we, he's not a voice crying out in the wilderness of, why do I believe us? But then he started saying some things. What's, in, what's interesting is he started, he gave, he, he mentioned a pair of mysteries, which I've studied in great detail and said, well, we need more critical thinking skills to solve these mysteries. And a lot of people who are into them haven't got these critical thinking skills. And he said, for example, I think, I think this, then he said, this is the bullshit I was talking about. Oh, yeah. And it is bullshit, unfortunately. He said, the Paul is dead theory. Okay, did you know that you could, there's, there's the same clues which lead towards Paul, Paul McCartney being dead also lead towards George Harrison being dead. And he gave some examples that someone had done like an experiment with song lyrics and symbolism that pointed towards George Harrison being dead, which indicates I don't think he's really studied the thing about Paul McCartney quite as much as he really should have. And then he really actually displayed his ignorance because 
he said, you know, Ros the Roswell incident. What was the Roswell incident? Oh, Jesse Marcel. In 1947, he discovers some debris, you know, balloon debris in a field. And then <clears throat> in 1980, the National Enquirer, the National Enquirer, this, this famous rather low quality paper in the United States, offers a million dollars for anyone who can come up with UFO evidence. And he says, well, I know, I'll make a big, I'll make a buck out of this. And so he come, then, in 1980, he comes forward and says, well, I knew all, all this Roswell stuff, you know, I knew all about it, I saw it all, things like that. And, um, the problem with that is, it's just, that's not actually what happened. It was actually 1980 the first book was published, The Roswell Incident by Charles Bullitts and William Moore. But Jesse Marcel actually, if you look into the Roswell incident, you'll know that that's actually, that's, I can't believe, you know, he, if he looked into it in any detail, this Neil Nixon, he would know this. It, it can be traced back, to, I mean, the modern, mod, the modern Roswell era can be traced back to 1978, which was unfortunately 31 years after the event happened, which has caused no end of trouble, as we know. But Stanton Friedman was introduced to Jesse Marcel then, two years earlier, than this National Enquirer prize. And the process by which Jesse Marcel's information became public and other witnesses came forward is far more complicated than how this guy's portraying it. He, he preaches critical thinking skills. Well, this is critical thinking, Neil. This is it. Oh, but, um, yeah, and um, he gives the examples of uh, urban myths. For example, 1973 FA Cup final and Sunderland come forward. In those days, they were a second division team and beat then what's then the first division, now it's the Premiership, Leeds United. It was an upset. And apparently there was some kind of figure when they, someone had to kick a ball and kick over the FA Cup with a ball, by kicking the ball. Um, that was an urban legend. Um, of course, there were loads of these sorts of things. There were loads of these sorts of urban myths that go around. Um, they turn out when you look into them not to be true. There was anecdotal, a friend of a friend of a friend told me this, things like that. It's sometimes the media propagates these things for entertainment. So he's right about that. There's no doubt he's correct about that. He then he said something that worried, what bothered me a little bit. <coughs> he says, firstly, he likes the Guardian newspaper. <laughs> he likes the Guardian newspaper, well enough said. Uh, you know what I think about that. And then, um, he also seems to be quite keen on Andy Roberts and Dr. David Clark. So, well, to be fair to Dr. Clark, has been pretty good over the Calvin UFO photo. But apart from that, you know, he's well known as a debunker, and Andy Roberts is a very aggressive debunker. Um, he gets quite uh, quite grumpy with people who believe in UFOs. So, hmm. Anyway, an interesting talk by Neil Nixon. So, um, but I just think he needs to look into some things a little bit closer. Next speaker, John Fraser. Now, beyond the poltergeist. Now, um, he talks an awful lot about some um, poltergeist. Now, um, poltergeists are different from normal, what you call ghosts. This is what came up in the panel discussion, actually. I made a comment um, about what ghosts were. I suspect ghosts are actually more than one phenomenon. And they are, ghosts are actually... A term, a generic term we use for more than one phenomenon, which we've categorised under an umbrella term that may actually not be appropriate. Uh, it's probably a number of different definitions and more. You know, it could be, in some cases, tricks of the mind. In other cases, it is spirits of the dead. In other cases, it's you know entities from other worlds. It could be many, many things. It could be projections, psychic projections from our own minds. The poltergeist is very interesting because the poltergeist... Very often, poltergeists can't be traced to a particular person. Um, so, um, by that I mean that they can't be traced to a particular individual as a spirit. So, the ghost appeared at this sort of place. There was a ghost who lived in this house, and uh, he was an old monk from the 16th century. He's come back as a poltergeist. Poltergeists um, are very often, they often are, have names. Sometimes they speak, and they can write with lipstick on mirrors and things like that. But all too often they just are anonymous. Or they have names which can't be traced to actual individuals. Poltergeists differ in the sense that most ghosts involve hauntings, which are ghosts attached to a particular place. 
there's supposedly a ghost in this house here, in this particular building, which used to be a monastery, as I explained last night. Um, however, poltergeists tend to be centered around a particular person. Very often, it's a, a, most commonly, it's actually a teenage girl. Um, it could be anyone. And um, he also says that um, he goes into the interesting idea about um, that electrical, you know, electrical activity can cause people to see ghosts. Uh, there's a man called Dr. Michael Persinger who has explored this in great detail, and his name came up several times today. The thing about um, Persinger, and um, indeed a lot of these theories are, is that seen as, you know, different people, you know, undergoing various kinds of electromagnetic fields often see the same things in certain places, indicates there's some objective reality to them. And rather than it simply being a case of the electromagnetic field cause some kind of hallucination rather than that, it's actually very more likely there that they seem to be able to tune the brain out of its normal perceptive field uh, state, its normal perceptive state, away from what Graham Hancock calls channel normal and allows us to perceive things which are uh, that it normally can't. That's probably more likely in my view. He said something very interesting. Um, the structure of the scientific revolution, what you have is you have an old, you have an old orthodoxy, no, anomalies come up within that orthodoxy, there's a scientific crisis and from that scientific crisis a new orthodoxy emerges and we've seen that many times in the past, Newton to Einstein to quantum theory and physics. Um, there's, and it could be we're going through one of those right now I and mean, we've had We've had our, we've had things upset. We've had many upsets over the years. We had Copernicus teaching us we weren't the center of the universe. Uh, then we had Darwin explaining how you know we weren't we weren't all made from lumps of clay by God's hands, and it was it was a more complicated process of evolution and things like that. We develop over many many periods of time. Then we had the the, um, the psychoanalysts like Freud, Jung, explaining how. You know, our minds were different to what we thought they were. And then finally, maybe the scientific revolution we're going through now is, is scientific. Is, we're, we're seeing anomalies from the old orthodoxy in terms of things like spirits of the dead, UFOs, aliens, things like that. And we could be undergoing another scientific revolution, which is that perhaps death is not the end of our existence and we're not alone in the universe. Things which I think happen to be true. That's kind of, we're going from the kind of anomalies to the crisis spirit phase now. And probably a new a new orthodoxy will emerge from that. Very interesting talk by John Fraser. Steve Parsons talked about the technology of ghost hunting. And he goes from, he showed us some kits from the old days of the time of Harry Price. You know, he'd have like, there would be like um, pieces of wire painted with luminous paint. Um, various kinds of objects which he'd move around and things like that. And then that these things gradually protect, protect um, progress to modern techniques, modern techniques, but um, none of these things have ever demonstrated absolute proof of the existence of ghosts and things like that. They just they're just very powerful indicators. But how many how many of them are necessary? You see, um, what he's explained is that, um, for example, I don't know, for example, someone's coming into the lounge area. Hello, how are you doing? I'm just doing some filming, it's all right. How are you doing? It's all right. That's no, okay. Yeah, he explained how um, how much of this technology is actually necessary when you consider, you know, because things like EMF meters and um, full spectrum camera camera things. I mean, they aren't for ufology. They are well worth having, definitely, especially, especially the full spectrum cameras, which can see infrared, ultraviolet. Nick Hayes uh, has got cameras with those filters on. But in terms of um, ghost hunting, it's slightly different. I mean, how how much is necessary? And he also makes the point that, which I've made many times, that along with the technology which exists today, allows you to see, for example, things you couldn't see before in terms of thermal imaging and um, things beyond the visible spectrum. It's also made fraud much much easier. And uh, Steve Parsons rightly points out there's a signal-to-noise ratio issue, a big signal-to-noise ratio issue. There's too much fake. It means a lot of the real stories are now buried under a mountain of 
very easily concocted hoaxes. This means that phys you know, physical evidence like photographic evidence doesn't carry the weight it used to. What he recommends is that um, it, the, probably the best thing to have is probably like a, a thermocouple for not... Th a thermometers are worth having because, see, most ghosts... People, most ghosts are seen with the naked eye. Eyewitness testimony. A lot of ghost hunts begin with eyewitness testimony, which is simply apparitions seen with the naked eye. Or things heard with just normal ears. They're heard by, by unaided ears and eyes. And then so when the ghost hunters turn up with EMF meters and they turn up with full spectrum cameras and thermal imaging, it's like, why? Why don't you just use your eyes and ears? You know, things like that. And he, he brings up an EVP. Now, he's also, he talked about um, a problem that I've... He then goes into this area of pareidolia and apophenia. This is that our brains tend to see and hear organised noise and vision, visuals from random patterns. Pareidolia is the visual version of this. This is the face in the clouds kind of thing. Apophenia is the audio version of this. So you see, you hear organised... You might hear it's like voices in just random noise. And you may hear music coming out of a car engine, especially if you've been you've dropped a few tabs of acid or something. But however, the problem with this argument is, which I've made many times, is that there's no real statistical ceiling on which people will agree on. I had this. I actually asked this of Dr. Paul Rogers, who was a speaker at the 2011 conference. You know, if you, you have to have a cut-off point. Apophenia and pareidolia is essentially coincidence theory. If you don't agree to some kind of cut-off point, it, it can be used as a, basically a get-out-of-jail card to explain any anomalous phenomena in terms of visual and audio evidence. Otherwise, you could just say that a, a piece of music, which is very obviously a piece of music, one that you like, it's just random noise, your brain's interpreting it that. You know, um, a waltz by Strauss is just a random noise. You could say that the um, the mural of the Sistine Chapel is just, it's pareidolia. Um, Michelangelo got angry one day and he started kicking pots of paint around, which made random splashes on the wall and ceiling. And suddenly, um, he, said, he looked at it and he thinks, I like that pattern, and he left it. And so what you see is hands of gods and cherubs with blue ribbon and things like that. That's actually just um, random patterns of paint splashes, which your brain interprets as a beautiful mural. Now, you might say, Ben, that's obvious. It's, it's obvious that's a painting. It's obvious. Everyone can see that. Well, in that case, you know, you, you have to have a statistical ceiling. How do you know it is? You see, because you're saying that something that looks organised can be random. OK, so does that mean everything that looks organised is random? Or is there some kind of statistical ceiling? Is there a cutoff point? And usually they start muttering about p-values and Bayesian inference and things like that. But really, it's, this is a discussion that needs to be had. Because I believe that in a certain instance, where skeptics have done exactly that. They have used the coincidence theory through pareidolia and apophenia to dismiss wrongly genuine anomalous phenomena. Genuine. Um... So that's, that was an interesting that was an interesting discussion, I think. Very interesting by Steve Parsons. Next on the list is Wow. Professor Chris French. Now he's the, the nice guy skeptic. I mean he's someone I I always get on well with. He invited me to speak at the ASAP Seriously Suspicious Conference. Um, which you know, I did a, I didn't film it unfortunately. I didn't record it, but you can. I did an article about it on her Panama Voice, and you can. Indeed, I did. I did a studio version of the talk I gave. Now he he went through again his work at the Anomalistic Psychology Unit at the at Goldsmith College London, and he says that the definition of it is basically finding finding psychological reasons for what we call paranormal phenomena. But at the same time, he says, leaving leaving the an open-minded possibility that some of them are real. But the general premise, though, is that they're not real and that there are psychological reasons why people wrongly perceive these things. And he, 
talked about various things like um he's been he's done a lot of work in the media such as Derek Oval Ogilvy, the baby mind reader, things like that. He's dealt with Richard Dawkins. He's dealt he's tested various people such as Patricia Butt, the medium, who um that's an interesting experiment he did with Richard Wiseman. It's been widely criticized actually by uh, Martin McLuhan in the Randy Prize book. Um but uh, he's also tested Oriel um Oriol Rayanu, the guy who can apparently stick things to himself with magnets. Now Richard didn't uh, Richard and Chris didn't actually explain what he was doing, but they did test him to see if he, if they put like tissue paper over his skin, if he could still stick things, and apparently um he couldn't, which because there was this idea that he got sweaty and it, his skin became sticky. Um Richard Dawkins also did a um, a dowsing experiment that was featured in Richard Dawkins's documentary called um, Enem Enemies of Reason. Enemies of Reason. That's what it is. I'm Richard Dawkins. I'm very clever. And I've made a thing called Enemies of Reasons because I alone have reason. I know. I paid half a million pounds for it in 1969. Reason belongs to me. Anyway, you know what I think. Well, Dickie Dawkins. Um, now... The experiment seems to... They tested dowsers using double-blinded experiments and Dawkins is praising Chris French and things like that. Now, I don't know much about this experiment. Chris told went through a bit more details that were left out of the actual TV show. It doesn't surprise me that it was left out. I mean, I know someone else who was interviewed for that series and portrayed in a very derogatory manner, and that is Dr. Mangier from, you know, who does the... who did this, the um, punk science thing on on The People's Voice. Um, Mangier Samantha Lawton. She was interviewed by Dawkins. Well, there was a three-minute segment with her. He said it took hours to film, and they edited that, edited her down to three minutes. <laughs> That's typical of the mainstream media, isn't it? Um, and then he said, he said, he said, he started talking about open-mindedness, and he put up a slide saying about how it's good to be open-minded. And I sort of braced myself. I braced myself. Is he going to? Is he going to make that bloody classic joke? Is he going to do it? Is he? Oh, please don't do it. Don't do it, Chris. Don't do it. Well, you'll be pleased to know he didn't. He didn't make that classic, classic, overused joke. <laughs> if he had, oh, God, I'd have groaned and groaned. I think a lot of, I wouldn't have been the only one groaning if that had been the case. I really don't. <laughs> but he didn't. So, that was interesting to hear Chris French and... There was a panel discussion, actually, and uh, Deborah Hyde was there, the, the editor of Skeptic magazine, the Skeptic Witch, as she's called, because she had a blog called Jordamain, and Jordamain was actually a... Uh, Marjorie Jordamain, her name was, was a witch berry, uh, who was burned at the stake in the 16th century. All right, guys, all right. And so, um, but, uh, yeah, she, she... I don't think she's a speaker, though, incidentally. She's like, not a speaker. It was nice to hear old Frenchie again. That was quite, that was quite cool. Good old Frenchie. Now, the next speaker was Dr. Anne Winsper. Like, she uh, does a lot of, um, she's a parapsychologist, and she, and I, I mentioned her, actually. She was at Weird Weekend North. She recognised me. I said hello to her. I, was, I knew, I heard about her before I met her, actually, because she used to get into arguments with Don Phillips, who, uh, you know, who I know, you know I'm, I'm, I've collaborated with several times. And she talked about the... Comitus. Now the Comitus are Estonian ghosts because apparently she's half Estonian, a bit like Cassandra de Roy. And um, she talked about how there's lots of ghosts in Estonia, and it may be to do with the trauma the nation has suffered. It's it's a it's a small nation. It's one of the Baltic states, and it has suffered enormously, suffered and experiencing numerous wars. It's been occupied by Russia twice and once by Germany in the last 500 years. Finally, won its independence, its latest period of independence in 1991. Since then, it's joined NATO, which is a bad idea. Um, but, um, that's, a, that's a story for another time. But um, during these periods of occupation, uh, there was um, export, you know, um, Jewish people were basically um, removed at certain points. There were pogroms. Um, things like that. There's been a, the result of this was a huge amount of trauma, mental trauma over a large scale, which, as you know, you know, d does it seem to attract these kinds of phenomena? We made point I, I mentioned before about hospitals and things like that. 
the number of ghost photos and videos in hospitals. Mm. Um, but there was a children's book came out in 1994 about the the Comitus, which is interesting because um, this is only just after independence. But there's like a famous Estonian children's book about saying about a friendly Comitus. It's um, quite a sweet looking book. Um, the the Comitus is like many other ghosts. They, they seem to fall into different categories. There's revenants, stone tape, uh, active ghosts, which. Um, active ghosts which interact with people and there's even a feminist ghost oh, that's how i would describe this ghost it's a woman who's very badly mistreated by her she was a slave who was badly mistreated by her male owner and uh, and eventually suffered terrible a terrible death being bricked up you know being basically shoved into a space and then in a wall and then there was bricks put over her and she died that's a horrible thing to do but she now tries to strangle men in their sleep you know, just just any random guy. Um, if he's sleeping alone, she'll come up and try to strangle him. You know? If you can't get the guilty, the innocent will do. That's, that's what a lot of feminists are like, unfortunately. The, the in there's this very sort of desres in Tallinn, the capital of Estonia, which is um, which is the uh, it's apparently it's like a, it's like holiday it's holiday apartments now, and that's very very haunted. And there's the um, the owners are trying to keep it quiet, but the thing is that used to be the headquarters of the KGB. Um, they used to joke that it's got the best view in the world from the windows. You can see all the way to Siberia, because a lot of the people were arrested, and they were taken to Siberia, the the, the gulags, and um, of course there were torture. There was torture done. There was execution. Oh yeah, I mean, especially in the Stalin era, you know. Um, so yeah, that's a pretty pretty awful situation, but it's very interesting. Her talk was very interesting indeed, and I'm very grateful to for the information. Like like the others, I learnt a lot from this day altogether. I learnt a lot from all the speakers actually today. So that was very interesting. Never thought about the ghost of Estonia before. David Saunderson has um very interesting. He runs the Spooky Isles website now. He talked about Sleepy Hollow. A Sleepy Hollow is a, of course, it's a well, it's most recent encounter. It's a well-known film by Tim Burton. Um, stars Johnny Depp, like a lot of Tim Burton's films do. Uh, it's like a horror movie, ghost story. Um, it's set in the United States in the in the um, 19th century, but it's actually based on a an English legend. It was written by an American, Washington Irving, but its inspiration was actually a. Um, it was actually a, a um, an English town. There's an English town called Sleepy Hollow where the headless horseman is supposed to be. And um, I'm afraid I didn't hear all of this talk because I had to even get some fresh air. I was getting tired. But um, what surprised me about what this guy said, David Swanson, was that a lot of what we call Halloween ritual, you know, the, the jack-o'-lantern, and various other and the and the dressing the trick or treats, a lot of it comes from Washington Irving. Well, it seems like you get you get this a lot actually. You know that pop, you know that things we think of as ancient traditions actually come out of fiction and popular culture. You know the classic is the Hollywood cowboys and Indians. I mean, a lot of that has nothing to do with history. It always distorted. A lot of history in reality, history wasn't like that. You know, cowboys and Indians didn't fight, you see, for example. It's settlers and Indians that fought. Things like that. It's very interesting, that. Yeah, um, good, good, good stuff. Again, you know, I, I missed about a third of his talk, but what I did hear was extremely interesting. Right, there was a panel discussion. Now, I, again, I came in back a bit late to this, but um, it seemed to be, the general theme seemed to be, oh, the the social effect of paranormal belief, for example, apparently the Thames water uses dowsing. Now I d I don't know, I find that a bit incredulous, but I mean, it's possible. And this the guy who proposed this did say that he, he's he's had this confirmed. Um now I'm not anti dowsing personally. I know Chris French has found it doesn't work and things like that. But, yeah. There's also this video, I've actually seen it, of um this woman on the New York subway, the underground train who appears to be, she has some kind of seizure and attacks a man opposite her. 
on the throne. And there's, I mean, the anti-feminists have made a big point about this because it's when she attacks this man opposite her, the police turn up and arrest him, not rather than her. Um, now, I, obviously, I don't think I've seen enough to make a judgment. That's really a separate point. But um, I do find it... Um, well, I mean, it's the video, I, I can't remember what the video is called, but either, either in the video's title or description or the comments, a lot of people suggesting it was demonic possession. Indeed, it could be, but people in, people in, in the panel discussion were saying, well, why, why is this, why do people suggest that so soon? You know, surely that's not something that people should, should be one of the first things people suggest. Because obviously the most likely problem is she's having some kind of grand mal seizure. Or something like that. Um, is paranormal belief progressive? Um, things like that. Um, and then they ask, what was the most intriguing and most ridiculous investigation you've ever done? Um, Deborah Hyde was there. Like I said, I don't think she's a speaker. She, maybe they changed the schedule, and she is. But she talked about her own sleep paralysis experience. And this is when they asked, cause they asked people to define ghosts. And Deborah Hyde said, oh, they're just it's the way our minds work. It's a manifestation of the brain. Lionel Fanthorpe says it's spirits of the dead. I actually put my hand up at this point and when they when they opened it up to the floor and I, and I someone came to me and I said, I think it's a ghost is a, a word, it's a generic word we've used to categorise probably several different phenomena, which may well be every all the definitions all the definitions that we've heard so far and more. I think it's true. Lionel Fanthorpe was there as well and he's like, um, What's interesting is that he's he's still going strong. He's still he's still got that like charm and sort of warmth about him, Lionel Fanthorpe. I mean, you know, I've in, I've interviewed him on her Panama Radio. I've met him several times. He was at the twenty eleven event. I met him at the Bufora twenty twelve conference too. Um, I didn't know he was if he was alive or not, but he is. He's obviously like older now. He's eighty seven. He's been writing books for seventy years. <laughs> That's quite something. And um, and he uh, he was in the panel. He's still doing. He's still got that kind of like ch that charisma that he hasn't lost. That sort of um, knowledge and that ability to tell a good story. It's still with him. He's still obviously you know he's still very strong mentally. Mentally in his head, he's still he hasn't deteriorated at all. Dr. Rachel Ironside um, talks about making sense of the paranormal, and she's actually done a she's done a course on this, and she's um, a PhD professor, and um, she actually some of her students were among the other speakers, you know, um, and she talked about um, how she talked about joint witnesses, and she did ghost hunts. Uh, this is where more than one person perceive something at the same time. Now, of course, a lot of skeptics just, skeptics, again, they have this raising the bar thing, which is very annoying, which I've talked about in my skeptic lecture, most recently done at Sufon. Um, you know, you when someone, you, you set out some conditions for accepting something as real, someone meets those conditions and you start adding more conditions on and on and on. And they do this. I mean, some skeptics will say, well, if, you, if one person sees it, well, you can't confirm that. It's just a single witness. Two people see it, Oh, it's folly, I do. A madness shared by two. Okay, three, four, five, six, seven, and hundred people see it. Mass hysteria. It's like you see it's a get out of jail free card again. But, you know, to a credit, Dr. Ironside, I think, understands this and, and doesn't go along with it. Um, and she talks about how people, you know, she studies more, she, she doesn't so much study the paranormal as people who investigate the paranormal. So people like me, you know, I could be on a couch. At a certain point um and what she says is people keep saying things like i was just doing x when y happened and a lot of this happens with a lot of explanations including people who are victims of crime or witness crime they say to the police i was i was just walking to the shops when i saw these bank robbers coming out and things like that and people who report paranormal phenomena do that as well and they also keep using the word that they say things like, what, does, what was that? Or, did you see that? Did you hear that? Um, I, I think that might be kind of just normal. I don't know if that's actually relevant. Hmm. 
She also talks about subjective, the value of subjective evidence, and that's good. I'm, I'm glad she believes that. You see, I've had subjective, strange experiences, and when I, you see, I've reported them, and it turns out that other people have had the same thing. For example, when I was in Nottingham, in the court, in the old halls of justice, I wrote an article about this. This was in 2016. I um, was sitting in this courtroom, the old courtroom, and I felt like something like touching me like that, it's like spider webs on my face. And apparently that is, that's quite common when spirits are around. And people have often perceived that, especially sitting in the part of the courtroom that I was. That wasn't the only weird thing that happened that night, I'm telling you. Oh. Then the next speaker was Dylan Jones. Dylan Jones is this Welsh guy, as you can guess from his name. He's a student of um, Dr. Rachel Ironside. And uh, he's doing, he's a retired policeman who does his who's doing his uh, PhD on um, modern paranormal groups, or MPGs, as he said. And again, he's doing something quite similar to, he's studying the people who study the paranormal, rather than the paranormal itself. And in fact, you're learning about people like, people who, who study the paranormal, have an interest in the paranormal, is actually, I think it's an important field to study, and it may be the key to learning more about the paranormal. And he says, he says, he talks about the influence of the film Ghostbusters. Now, I'm very fond of this 1984 comedy. It's very highly acclaimed. Uh, it's an extremely witty film, very exciting and very, very amusing. Um, it, because most of it is science fiction. There, is no, there are no laser guns which can target ghosts, which mustn't cross the beams and things like that. And there's no trap you can put a ghost in. But a lot of people who get involved in paranormal research do. For example... The Ghostbusters have like an emergency. They have an emergency service. It's like an old fire station. They have an old ambulance which they call Ecto One, and a lot of some paranormal groups have that. They actually have like vehicles. Sometimes they are converted ambulances, and they have on the side, you know, this is the, the, the logo of the paranormal group. And um, there's these. He showed this video, very amusing video indeed of these ghost hunters. I think it's the Tennessee Wraith Raiders or something like that. They've come up with their own ghost trap. Because you know, when ghosts are around, sometimes the batteries of electrical devices get drained. And they've come up with this idea of reversing the process and they go, and they're so funny because they're like these, these hillbillies. <laughs> what we're gonna do boys, we, we got these solar panels and the ghosts will go to the solar panels and then we'll drain their energy into flat batteries. <laughs> Oh man, it's, I don't think that's, that doesn't fit with what I know about um, what I know about ghosts and how they work. But it's still incredibly funny. I mean, these guys are just so funny. Um, I wonder how serious they are, to be honest. Um, but he talks about ghost hunters through the ages and modern paranormal groups and things like that. Um, and um, you know, to be honest, it's like. Dan Aykroyd, for example, who's a, a Canadian comedian who actually plays, he's actually uh, plays Dr. Ray Stance, one of the, one of the Ghostbusters and one of the men in the series. He's very into UFOs now. I mean, as he's got older, he's become very pro-UFO. Um, so that's, I wonder why, maybe, maybe something to do with that, you know, maybe something to do with this. And he talks about the, um, was it professionalism and regulation? A lot of ghost hunters have this, even if it's just a veneer, this idea of professionalism and regulation, you know. They often say they're members of organisations, they set up, like, regulatory bodies. In fact, ASAP itself, has, in 2011, became a regulatory body. Um, that was a big announcement, I remember. And there's, um, there's also this, they often... There are professional ghost hunters who have like business cards and things like that. They have Facebook pages and things like that. Very interesting. It was an interesting talk by, by Dylan Jones. Very interesting. Uh, and the final speaker of the day was the aforementioned Lionel Farrenthorpe. Now, he's an 87 year old guy. He's got his own YouTube channel. I must sub to that, actually. Um, he's been writing books for 70 years. He ran in 1952 when he was 17. And he's been basically involved in anomalous investigation he's written science fiction he's an ordained minister of the church he's a black belt in karate he's a motorbike enthusiast I and mean, there's not a lot he hasn't done it's not a lot he hasn't done all night long. um and he talks about roadside ghosts 
and he mentions um, the Dartmoor hairy hands. Now, I've just discussed this mystery before. This road in Dartmoor where people driving along, sometimes on a motorbike, they'll be driving along and suddenly they'll feel these hairy hands, usually invisible. Some, there's a couple of cases where people have seen them close over their hands and very, very strong, and they'll like, make you turn the steering wheel or handlebars and drive you off the road. Um, it is an accident, a black spot. Some people were killed in the accident, others survived and said, well, the, the hairy hands made me do it. Now, I was actually talking to someone at lunch and she told me, oh, it was just the, it was just an anomaly with the road, the camera of the road. So, disappoint, disappointing, she said. Um, the mystery was, was that, well, I don't know if it's disappointing, maybe it's a relief, but it may not be true. I mean, it may, there may be more to it. Obviously, the thing is, whenever these mysteries are supposedly solved, usually someone will come along and say, well, yes, but what about this? Or what about that? We've seen this with the Manchester Pusher and my, my discussion with Glenn Vaudry. Um, so maybe that's not the end of the story. Well, we'll see, I'll look into it and see. But he mentions um, some ghosts... Um, some le the legends of the headless horses and ghosts and headless horsemen actually come from smugglers who actually um, would scare people by painting themselves and their horses with luminous paint, apart from the heads of the horses and the heads of the people. It could be some of the legends come from that, although I don't think that can explain the entire phenomenon. He also mentions um, there was a car. Now, this was mentioned on 14 TV, his TV series. It was very good. You can get it on YouTube, actually. Do watch it. That's a show he made in the 90s. Um, there was a car which had the number 666 in its number plate. All kinds of weird things happened. Yeah. Also, strangely enough, he, he had a... He told, he, see, he's got a great sense of humour, Lionel. He's got, this really, he's got this really sort of charming wit about him. He's, a, he's like a son of, kind of like a... I wish he was my granddad. I really do. He'd be the perfect grandfather for me. Um, he talked about... Um, a weird case of a man who went into a toilet, a public toilet, he didn't come out. So his wife said, I'm not going to a gent's toilet, so I found some other bloke. They went in there, they couldn't find him, he wasn't in any of the cubicles. They called the police, the police went in there, couldn't find him. They started tapping on the walls to see if there were secret doors he could have escaped from. Um, a couple of hours later, he came out saying, great goodness me, I'm back. I said, what do you mean? I went to this place, I, 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 I went, when I went out of the toilet, as he said last time, I saw a really strange world where they were like electric cars. It's like you'd gone into the future. And um, I, went, I rushed back into the toilet in fear and I hid for a while. Then I came out and here I am. Everything's back to normal. Uh, something like this actually happened to me, actually, at the, the basis of the barge, as I've explained before. I, I believe I saw the past, not the future. But, hmm, it sounds like some kind of vision of a... Well, I believe the you can't actually see the future because the future, by its definition, hasn't happened yet. It could be anything. It could, if you see a future of electric cars, you know, you could like fiddle something to make sure that, you know, cars are never electric, and then that's not the future anymore. Do you see what I mean? So it's more likely to be an interdimensional vision. You know. Um, but anyway, but that was the end of that was all the speakers on day one, and I found them all very interesting. Um, a, a mixture of agreement, some disagreement in some cases, like with with Neil. Nixon, considerable, a lot of disagreements. I think he was totally wrong on a lot of things. But, you know, I, I, I enjoyed every talk and I learned a lot from all the speakers. So that's day one out the way. OK, guys, souvenirs again. Uh, this is uh, Crafty Nice, Liz from the Crafty Nice. It's her favourite part, so a big hello to her. OK, I've got my, uh, my, my reading books there, which I've been... I showed you those earlier. Um... That is my phone charger. That is my my laptop charger. I haven't, got, I haven't bought any books, any other books today. That's my toothbrush. This is the that's my moisturizer. Oh, I've got three. Oh, I did get these. These are three back copies of FT. And um, that's four twenty July. There's this one. Um, August. That's a, it's not really. It's not very very far back copies there and. This one is, where's this one? Oh, this is September, this is the second latest, because the October one's already out for subscribers. No, oh, never mind. Well, that's from the Fighting Fantasy. I remember those when I was a kid. And this here is a, a card of Spooky Isles. Um, paranormal, horror, and dark history in UK and Ireland. Yeah, David Saunderson, there's the address. Okay, um, 
This is my ticket, a very simple thing, just a blank sheet of paper with that on, nothing on the back. Um, that's my name badge, which I showed you earlier, yeah. Now this is a conference or film festival kind of thing. It's called the official program of the Fortean Film Festival. Make a film award, that looks good. But the problem is, it clashes with our own. But so, uh, there you go, um, I've shown you that already. Now these are instant, uh, one, one piece, these are like instant, what are they called? NY coffee three in one. So these basically have milk, sugar, added to coffee and you just put it in, just add hot water, it's very simple. I, I, I nicked a few of those from the hotel. Well, I say nicked, they're for us anyway, so, yeah. So that was the souvenirs, a bit shorter than usual, but uh, Liz and everyone else, I hope you like them. Okay, I just want to get a quick shot of the, of the hotel from the front. And it's a lovely, charming place. I do recommend the King's Arms if you're ever in this village. It's an old village here. Yeah. It actually has a slightly ecclesiastical look, I think. I can well believe it was a monastery once. <coughs> there are reports of ghosts here. Um, but um, I haven't actually... I didn't see anything ghostly myself the whole time I was here. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but our bedroom was full of mirrors. There were mirrors everywhere on the wardrobe door. There's a mirror opposite my bed. Now, Rose, Rosemary Ellen Guiley, who's sadly no longer with us, she actually said you should not sleep in a bedroom with mirrors because that's how the, the gin get in. See, this is, you can see the, I showed you the porch last night. It's like in daytime. This thing, where the benches are here at the side, inside the porch. That's exactly normal for a church or a monastery. Yes, I can easily believe this was a monastery. It looks, has that kind of look to it. Anyway, time to, it's time for day two now of the ASAP Seriously Strange Conference 2022. We're higher up today. Thank you very much. Can you give yourselves a big round of applause? Oh. <laughs> Hello guys, I'm Steve Wills, who you'll know from other videos and uh, from folks. the mindset. You, uh, you enjoy yourself? Yeah, it's very good. Good turnout. Yeah. Good little venue for it. Uh, good good, good uh, array of different sort of speakers. And, uh, yeah, I'm enjoying it. Yeah, it's, 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 it's good. I mean, it's a bit different from most of the ones we go to. Or, I find it sort of like a mixture of skeptics and um, believers more, you know. I think yeah. Miles would Miles would probably blow a fuse if that's right. Well, it makes for good, it makes for a good Q and A, doesn't it? Um, yeah. Um, when you got when you got that kind of mix of people. I quite like that. I think so. Yeah, there's, I De there's Deborah Hyde over there. Did you see Deborah Hyde, the lady, the thin lady with the black dress? She is like a big time. She's the editor of Skeptic magazine. Um, I don't know if she's a speaker or not, but she's, she's here. Yeah, so, I mean, they go to the extremes like her, to, or Amethyst, uh, Amethyst Grey, who's that lady over there. Uh, she just did, um, she's obviously very much sort of on, on more on the woo side, probably closer to us than Deborah, uh, who just did a very good talk about Nikola Tesla. I mean, I'm familiar with the story of Tesla, but um, yeah, that's a. So which, who's your favourite speaker so far, do you think? Well, I was here yesterday um, as well. Um, I think, I think Alan's always very good, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, he's, he's good. Um, he's, he's done a lot about uh, Helen Duncan. Uh, he's, he's written about Helen Duncan. He's very well indeed. But, um, he talks, and I'll be saying more about him later, because he talks about the psychological assessment of the people like William Sargent, who is actually quite an infamous figure, I must say. Um, I've, I've got sort of like a bit of a personal connection to him, which I'll talk about later. But, um, yeah, um, but... Uh, about devil, de demonic worshipping. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How uh, some people say it's just skeptics. Skeptics will say, well, it's not, there's no such thing as de devils and demons, it's just they're mentally ill. Other people say, there's no such thing as mental illness, it's evil. Others say, there's no such thing as evil, it's just mental illness. And others say, no, it's de demonic possession. I mean, um, it's, there has to be some explanation about why. Because uh, there are some people who are behaving extremely negative and destructive ways, aren't they? Yeah, for sure. Well, not just in here. <laughs> They're everywhere. Well, I haven't actually met one here. But, um, <coughs> I mean, it could happen. They, they it exist. Happen, folks. Well, yeah. It could happen. Well, I find them everywhere. I mean, uh, there's several. Um, most people can report them in their lives. So, uh, why do they do what they do? That's the question. Yeah, it's an interesting one. No, no plain on. Can I have a good t shirt? Eric, oh, wicked, that's very good. And the Adidas Tri-Foil. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Pleasure, Ben. Good to see you. Good to see you, too.
Right, that's it. We'll, uh, we've got a 15 minute break and then it's the next segment. Okay, we're having lunch early. Only half an hour. The schedule's gone to pot again. Um, it's not enough time. Half, 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 yeah, half an hour. We won't even get everyone in the queue by half an hour. So, um, we're probably just going to... Well, we've got some of our own food with us, so we'll probably eat that. Interesting speakers, again, um, on this second and final day of the conference. Um, obviously, I'll go through them later again, like I did before. Unfortunately, the Paranormal Olympics is not on. This disappointed me. Um, I was looking forward to that. But the, uh, the chance to test your psychic skills in the laboratory... You can't do it this time. They're hoping to do it next year or next conference. Because that's one of the things I enjoyed most about the 2011 conference. So, that's a pity. That's a great pity. Anyway, we're at the Lime Bar now. And uh, this is this place. And we're going to... I don't know what we're going to do. See you later. Rihanna's acting as camera woman right now. Because I noticed something a bit disturbing a little while ago. Because, you know, I've got this alien face on my arm, which I pointed to earlier. Now, Miles did a... Scan of that and I found there was um, that there was um, some implant in there. Well, I've got this line, this red line across it. Do you see it there? It's like a scratch. I don't know how it got there. I've had it like all weekend. I thought there might be sheet marks on the bed, but it's, you know those just wear off after a while, after a few minutes. This has lasted and it's itching. It's itching really badly, and I don't know what it is. It's um, is it? Was it? Do you think it was Leonardo? Really it looks like you've, you've like a scratch mark or mm. that you banged into something. Right, I don't remember banging it on anything. I don't really just um, do you, do you know what it could be? I have no idea. You said it was, it might be some kind of trauma or something? Well, according to Alan Murdy's talk, you're either possessed or you're exhibiting some kind of inner trauma. All oh, right, so both sound pretty bad to me, but um, I'll have a word with him and see what he says. But uh, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. You see, now you, you know about there is an implant in there, according to the scan I had, so... Um, I don't know if it's got anything to do with that. Maybe I hope I've got a second implant. I've got no memory of any experience that will lead me to believe that I had any implants put in. But you know, it was detected. It has an electromagnetic field and an EMP pulse. You know, EMP. Um, so strange. Anyway, thanks for um, filming now, Leon. Okay. Okay, guys. I've I've left the venue now. I'm going to have to go. Um, I've. Uh, I think I might have to get back to their home in Wales. I've got to get back to Oxford. Uh, the reason is because, of course, I'm going to Mablethorpe tomorrow. So there's uh, quite a lot going on. Um, it's not over for me yet, but I've had a wonderful time. I had to leave just before the end of Richard Freeman's speech. Uh, Richard Freeman, of course, is a, he's a total dude. He's a total lad. <laughs> he's a mad lad. He's cool. It's him. Um, hey, Michael. How you doing? Yeah. Hi, Rhiannon. But yeah, I'm going to have to head off now, but I've had a wonderful time. It's been great. It's a shame it has to end, really, you know, but of course, all conferences have to end, but uh, I've really enjoyed it. I'll say, uh, I'll give you a review of the speakers later. I've got to go to the station and get a train. London, Here I am at a bar. There's the landscape behind me. It's quite, Food and drink is it's quite a nice, um, First nice, lovely place, actually. That's my train Standard coming soon. In zones one, two, Three and eight to ten. Cycle spaces in zones two and nine. Wheelchair facilities in zones five and six. Platform two That's here. for the 1743 Great Western Railway service to London Paddington. Can I do my filming now? Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm on my way back. It's been quite a speedy departure, actually, going straight. Went straight from the conference venue to the station. And uh, I'm getting straight on the train, literally in about 20 minutes. I've le le left the auditorium at the end of Richard Freeman's speech and I'm um, heading back. But, uh, the sooner I get back, the better because of what I've got to do next, which is my I've got to basically organize my trip to Mablethorpe, including getting my slides together and doing a little brief rehearsal. So um, it's no time to lose. It's uh, a bit of a schedule to keep.
through it quite quickly. Bye bye bath. Be back soon, I hope. Lovely oldie worldy station, isn't it? You always know the old, really old station because the brickwork, the mortar between the bricks is black because it's stained by the soot from the steam locomotives in the old days. Okay, guys, uh, we'll say a little bit about Sunday speakers now. Um, now, CJ Roma came on first. Now, of course, he was the um, he was the MC for day one, and um, he came on to talk about what they did last night. Now, it's a pity I missed it actually because I'd like to have taken part in it. To be honest, I kind of did my own little version of this at the last um, Exopolitics, as not Exopolitics, at the last ASAP Seriously Strange conference in 2011. This is what's known as the Ghost Machine. Um, uh, that's what I called it. But basically, it's a very simple experiment that anyone could do. You simply stare at yourself in a mirror in a very dim, dimly lit environment, and very soon you start to perceive appar apparitions. Basically, things such as your face, your face changes, sometimes faces will appear beside you, all kinds of strange, and sometimes you even hear things. And indeed, they, they just, they, he did this experiment to um, induce apparitions. And um, he did a, he did several. Now he, Christian apparently himself is a skepper. He, he is a skepper, but he talked about um, how the, the he did the experiment on various people who were there at the conference. I think three took part, and they all reported strange experiences. Now he was very very careful to take to take care of them. You know to make sure they hadn't suffered from recent bereavements, to check they were all right afterwards, things like that. Look after their psychological health. He did it very professionally, and I think that's very good of him. He also mentions the story of someone called H. Now, this is a woman who who has been having regular contact with with her um, with her husband who died, which is quite nice. It, it's rather like the story I heard on. I don't know if you listened to the unexplained with Howard Hughes. They had a woman on there who had the same experience. So she was a skeptic, or sort of very agnostic about the afterlife. But when her husband passed away from very suddenly from um, esophageal cancer she started getting messages from me it's called the book is called whatsapp whatsapps from heaven because sometimes she did receive what whatsapp messages from from hacked accounts and things and it looked like it was him doing it um i can't remember the name of the i can't remember the name of the actual person you find it on the unexplained with howard hughes now the uh, the second speaker was dr ursula wolski although that sounds polish she, she actually sounds english and now she's researching the researchers, so she, she's kind of doing what Karen Douglas is not doing. <laughs> well, that's not quite fair, actually, because I, the, all I induced Karen Douglas to do... Now, Professor Karen Douglas, if you remember um, from the video, I actually went to see one of her talks, is a psychologist, yeah, so I, I say that in the most euphemistic way possible, who is doing research, and has been doing research into conspiracy theory beliefs. And I challenged her at... Um, it was the same year as the last HACCP conference, actually. I challenged her and said, you know, have you thought about doing experiments into sceptics and what sceptics believe? But this Dr. Ursula Walski is actually doing research into um, <clears throat> into the paranormal research and belief community. And she talks about something that I've observed as well. Something that I've observed. Like, most people are pretty much indifferent. They're in between us. They're between sceptics, there's in between us, and there's believers. This this was to come up several times in several of the, among several of the. Um, well, I'm just going the wrong way. I'm turning the page the wrong way. Okay. Um. This was to come up several times in among several of the speakers actually, um, and um. So what was the reason that people, people get involved in paranormal research? You said there's some people do it for entertainment and excitement. This is rather like Dylan Jones talking about the Ghostbusters. You know, that, that was very influential, even though Ghostbusters was pure fantasy. It seems to have influenced some real paranormal researchers. And they have, like, the vans and they have the uniforms and things, you know. And um, she talked about some of it is actually 
she believes, and I, she may well have a point actually, <clears throat> is that it's to do with the question over life after death. Is there an afterlife? Do we continue after our death? Now, this is very, very, uh, this is, a lot of people are going to be curious about this, especially if they approach their own demise or they just lost someone they love. Now, the film, in, the Collateral Beauty, I, um, I didn't think was very good on reflection, the one with Will Smith, where he plays a grieving father. Um, but it does have some good points. For example, you see the, the poor guy, I mean, he's, he's, he's totally depressed over prolonged grief. And he's sitting there and he's, one of the, he's got a pile of books, and one of them is Journey of Souls and Destiny of Souls by Robert Newton, which explores this sort of thing, and it's because he's just lost his daughter. Um, of course, you know, the, 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 the implication is that there's a kind of wishful thinking element. The skeptics jump on this and say, well, there you are then. The whole thing is simply a psychological manifestation of our desire for something to be, whether it is or not. My answer to that is, well, that's not an explanation of whether it's real or not. Uh, that's an explanation of why people believe in it if it were not true. But I happen to believe it is true. And the question would then inevitably, well, is there is is there wishful thinking on the other side? And the answer is yes. I call it MBA, Materialist Bravery Award. Because if you don't believe there's an afterlife, well, it makes you a pretty superior person, doesn't it? It makes you, it makes you a brave, brave fearless person who can doesn't need that emotional crutch to get out of their bed every night out of their bed every morning they can live their life without this comfort blanket this cotton wool wrapped delusion of their afterlife you know it's uh, yeah and for this reason i think the wishing the wishful thinking argument cuts both ways in my view i'll explain in more detail in my skeptic talk um Dr. Wolski also looks into explanations for the experiences, which vary, reactions to others to investigations, and, and how to make paranormal investigation more credible. It was a very interesting talk. Alan Murdy, now once you get this guy started, you can't stop him. Um, he talked about possession and demonic possession. Now, they, he discussed exorcism, which is known best through the film The Exorcist. About, uh, it's a film about a, a young girl who becomes possessed by a demonic being. Um, that film was actually quite well done. It's quite well researched. The the way the girl and he he goes through some of the symptoms of exorcism, um, a possession, physical symptoms, psychological symptoms, psychological symptoms, neurological symptoms. Someone else brings this up later, but um, he talks about uh, Annalise Michel, uh, who is a young a young girl from France, who appears to be is probably the inspiration for the girl in the film The Exorcist. She um, was very she behaved in very similar ways you know the growling voice things like that it's anti-social behavior destruction you know being violent superhuman strength all these other sim all these other symptoms and apparently <clears throat> the idea of demonic possession and the ability to exercise them can be found everywhere in christianity obviously despite what was said in the film the exorcist that it's something that's just not done every day the church of england every every diocese has the church of uh, every diocese of the of the church of england has its own deliverance minister. They don't say exorcists. Uh, to this day, um, it also occurs in voodoo, in Siberian shamanism, in the Middle East, in, in Islam, and Jainism, and Judaism, these things across the world. Um, and he discusses real crimes and um, committed by possessed people or against people who are believed to be possessed. And he mentions the psychological research into this, and he brings up some rather sinister names, such as William Sargent. Now, William Sargent is one of these mind benders from the post World War II era that um, got involved in things such as the Stanford Research Institute and the Tavistock Institute. Now, um, of course, he worked very closely with Isabel Menzies Live, of whom I have. I wish I hadn't, but I have personal experience with. She's kind of my. She was my step grandmother. And. She talks about the similarities, the, the, the possession and things like possession in, say, poltergeist cases. He brings up the subject of Janet Hodson, Hodgson, who was appears to exhibit some of the same, even though she was in a house where there's a poltergeist, she exhibits some of the symptoms of um, possession. And indeed, in the film, The Exorcist, there are like poltergeist-like act, like activities, because, for example, the bed goes up and down, and the you know furniture moves across the room, doors lock by themselves, things like that. And um, he also t says something very interesting. He, he talks about a book called, what was it called? Uh, People of the Lie by Scott Peck. That sounds interesting. Remind me to read that book. Um, and he also mentions 
Nicholas Spanos, who takes the opposite view and says that basically um, there is no such thing as demonic possession or mental illness or anything. It's just all evil, um, just people being evil. But he, funny enough, Alan Murray mentions people seeing shape-shifting lizards, people shape-shifting into reptilian humanoids. It's not just David Icke. Yeah. Right, Amethyst Gray, talk, who seems to be the most woo-woo person there, uh, even more so than me, talks about Nikola Tesla. Now, she's actually also, she's written some books that look very sort of like uh, New Age. She's also, so she gives an outline, basically, of Nikola Tesla's life, and um, it moves her very much. She starts crying at the end. Um... And um, apparently she's got some work on Schauberger, Wilhelm Reich as well, so that's quite good. So despite being very new age, she's obviously down to earth. Um, Hannah Gilbert um, talked about the sites of trauma of, of asylums. These are old-fashioned mental hospitals and um, the fact that there are so many ghosts in the asylums. And apparently it's not just the patients who are ghosts. And she says, I hope they don't exist because to be trapped in in a kind of purgatory, in a ghostly purgatory in a place like that, it's horrible. There are ghosts of doctors in the asylums, and apparently the doctors in the asylums were totally evil. And um, she refers to the practice of lobotomies, which luckily didn't last very long. Although a lobotomy was performed in the 80s on the singer Lina Zavaroni. Um, she was a last ditch attempt to cure her anorexia nervosa, um, which didn't work, and sadly she died in her early 30s. But um, it's extremely controversial to do them nowadays. Um, Reverend Peter Law. Now he was—he says he was a teen rebel, and he used to—he was an atheist, but used to—he used to go into churches and vandalise prayer books with satanic symbols. Not because he was a satanist, just to just to wind them up. But he, when he went to Lancaster University, he became a born again Christian, and um, he says, and he's now a minister. He's Reverend Peter Law. He writes for Fortune Times. Um, he says religion is in decline, and he also discusses something I've been very interested in, that is the rise and fall of new atheism, the Dawkinsian atheism, which seems to be in these, it seems to be waning now after it, it was looking like this was going to be the, the dominant philosophy of the 21st century, the way it took off after Dawkins' book came out. And there were lots of follow up, there were lots of copycat books as well, like uh, Christopher Hitchens' God is Not Great, um, a couple of others, but. It looks as if that seems to be on the on on the descendancy now. He says most people, or he calls nuns. That doesn't mean women in religious orders. It means people with N O N E S nuns. They have, have they have no real religious affiliation, but they're open to the idea of spiritual and paranormal, and they don't attend regular weekly services at, at a religious institution. That's rather like me. And he says both religion and the paranormal address the big questions and both both deal with death anxiety which we've discussed heard already from um, dr wolski and um they are very no i'll just uh let's make sure i get these pages in the right order yeah um hmm. death and they both deal with death anxiety um and things like that and it's this important point because you know my this is in my sort of life at the moment because you know my my dad, when my dad's retired now, but when he worked, he had a boss, and um, they got on very well. And now, and now he's retired. They remain good friends. And his wife died a couple of years ago. This was a lady I knew very well. She used to babysit for me when I was a little kid. Uh, she used to get me a Christmas card every year until well, three weeks before she died. Um, she was. Um, you see, my dad's boss was an, was a big time MBA, -er, and he's very extreme disbelief in afterlife. And it's pretty clear he enjoyed it. He was a very, very much a back slapping MBA. -er. But now he's actually in a bad way since his wife died, and he he can't go back on his beliefs because he thinks they're not true. And he's now seeing a bereavement counsellor, and he's he's in a bad way. You know. Um, this he also Laura also mentions how paranormal. Research now uses religious terms like de demons and things like that as well. Now, demonic possession seems to be one of the themes of the day because Beth, Beth Darlington, that was the next speaker, now she was the MC as well, um, she starts talking about demonic possessions and alternative, possible alternative explanation, including for Annalise, Ma Annalise Michael, the French girl. Um, and she says, well, the thing is about ideas of demonic possession seem to go up and down so for example during the middle ages they were very very possible they were very very um prevalent i mean the idea goes back to the second century she reckons but it probably may well be earlier than that um 
but because I happen to believe it's a real thing. But um, she says that during times of the civil war and plague, it went up because people were looking for reasons to why there was all these horrible things were happening. It went down with in the 18th century because that was the rise of science and the enlightenment. Um, it went up again in the mid 20th century because, of course, the first the first half of the 20th century was full of war. So the first literally from the 1900 to 1950, it sort of it ascended and it waned off after the 1950s. She also mentions the exorcist symptoms, and she, she she cites Ben Radford. Now, he's a very controversial figure within the sceptic community, and he's got into a lot of drama, you know, um, with Micah Media talks about it, Karen Stolls now, and all the things he goes on about. Um, but he says, you know, basically he dismisses it as a mental illness. I think that Beth possibly does the same. Now, the next speaker was Christian Lander. Um, now, I'm familiar with this guy, because I've interviewed him twice, and he discussed the Thunderbolt incident. Now, the Thunderbolt incident is what he calls the Nottinghamshire Roswell. Now, um, he, this is basically, it goes up by other names, the Manfield incident, and things like that. And, um, so we figure the noise outside, there's some people, there's some people haven't, they've just got the door open, there's some people having a party on the, in the next flat. Um, there's, um... <clears throat> For example, he, he he's done a hell of a lot of research into this, getting witness te testimonies, working out exactly what happened, writing to people, things like that, which you'll be familiar with. Um, he also mentions the visits by the Russians. Now, some of the people got visits from strange people who appear to be Russian, which is odd because this was still the Cold War, even though it was sort of waning at the time. And there were military, there's military activity everywhere. These Russians guys, guys turned up in cars. I suspect these might be men in black. However, Christian actually dismisses dismisses the idea that there's anything extraterrestrial about this. He says um, he believes it was a Harrier jet, uh, a V-style aircraft, vertical sh and short takeoff and landing. Um, that was the thing that crashed at Thebes Wood, and it, it got it took off again and went to Aunt Annesley Hall. Um, now I can't really add anything to what I, I said to him actually at the, on the radio show because on the radio show I did dispute this because he he says that basically the the hovering engine of the Harrier actually caused the damage in, in many cases. Um, so, for example, the um, in one case, the, the slide in a children's playground was melted and um, TV, aerial, oh, te sorry, TV aerial split, um, chimneys were broken. Oh, and, and the heat was so intense that it, it, went down and it went down into a house and blew up a boiler. Now, um, I'm not an aircraft engineer, and maybe people who know more about it can comment. I dispute that the uh, the heat generated by an aircraft over the t certainly over the time period by which the harry was flying over you're talking about radiated heat and convected heat it was quite that intense i mean you've seen people on look at st. st martin you know they they just when the jets when the jets take off in st martin in the caribbean the people play around in the jet exhaust you know it's jet engines don't actually produce that much heat i don't think but um i think afterburner maybe but uh, even then you know it's um, that's it. Maybe an aircraft engineer could say more. Becky Smith. Now, she talked about um, apparitions and scratches, and she talked about a hotel in the West Midlands, which was haunted. Now, she believes that the, that the haunting was kind of a publicity stunt. This was a famous hotel where Laurel and Hardy stayed, and George Formby performed, and things like that, in, in um, Dudley, I believe it was, in the West Midlands. But... Um, Anyway, um, the scratches, see, I've, I've still got it, I think. Is it still there? Yeah, it's still there. See, you see the scratch? It's still there. Yeah, going along there. Maybe you can't see it as much. I can feel it, but... Yeah, it's, it's weird that that happened. Um, she says that she didn't believe anything like that. Now, Robert Moore. Now, Robert Moore, <clears throat> he, he's the, he was, along with Neil... Along with Neil Nixon, he's the guy who focused most on UFOs. He said there were six eras of British UFOs. Firstly, historical. That's the Middle Ages to 1947, that big year. And then, of course, then in, in the second era was flying discs, 1947 to 59. Everything's parallel to the USA, he says. Then 1960 to 1969 was social, social concession, he said. And he talked about uh, the, the arrival of uh, UFO studies at the Ministry of Defence and things like that. Um, the, then the next era after that was... Oh, yeah, also in the 1960s were the first civilian UFO groups who uh, also got together, like the MOD did, to study these things. For example, Bufora was formed in 1964. It was also, and the 60s was also the time of the Warminster thing. 
Now, the fourth era was 1970 to 79. Increased strangeness, there was the Welsh Triangle, the Livingston Incident, or the, the Decamont Woods Incident, where Robert Taylor was attacked by a spherical object and left behind marks on you know, his trousers ripped and things like that, marks on the ground. There was the, there was the Daventry abduction, I think it was 1976 or something, that was the, I don't know much about that. Apparently there was another abduction in 73 in Britain. Of course, I say abduction, the, the reported abduction. There were many before then, there were many before then. Um, the next era was after that was the 1980s. Now, that, of course, that began with, naturally, the Rendlesham Forest incident, which is very influential on ufology since then. Uh, Jenny Randalls came out with her, ob, ob, um, her Oz Factor again in the early 80s. Then Todmorden, again, in the, at the very beginning of the 80s, the two incidents at Todmorden. That is the abduction of um, um, Alan Godfrey, the, the police officer, and, of course, the death of Sigmund Adamski, which... Alan Godfrey, ironically, was in charge of investigating. The sixth and final era was um, the 1990s. This, of course, was X-Files, the Calvine photograph, which has now come back into the mainstream, and um, the rise of conspiratorial ufology, which is possibly inspired by the X-Files, but I think is based on reality. Um, What's, in, what's interesting, he, he, he says the, the sixth era was the 1990s. So what happened after, what about post-2000? Is that just what was that? He doesn't mention. He doesn't say. Um, he also mentions the ter he also mentions the phrase "rational solution," which again I have a problem with because it's almost exactly like Steve Mera's little habit word, rational explanation. As, as I was explaining before in my skeptic tour, there's no such thing as a rational explanation. There's only a rational method. <coughs> um, he also mentions something and pays tribute to some somebody. Now, this is something I've only learned this weekend. Kevin Goodman's died. Kevin Goodman is one of the researchers of the Warminster UFO, a guy I've interviewed twice on my show. Um, that's very sad. I'll, have to, I'll do a tribute show to him. I really will. That's, that's a great shame. So rest in peace, Kevin. The final speaker, the one I had to leave, I, didn't, I missed the last speaker, but the final speaker I saw was Richard Freeman, that charismatic... MC of the Weird Weekend North and, of course, the cryptozoologist. And he talks about the cryptids most likely to exist. And he, he says there are different kinds of cryptids. For example, he says, now, Jonathan Downs has his own scale, you know, cryptids, pseudo cryptids, and things like that, and sewer form phenomena. Richard divides them into cryptids, uh, living fossils, that is, things that are thought to be extinct, but which, come to, which um, actually are not, which he thinks is this is the most important one, and mega cryptids, that is, that is, creatures which are a known species but grow to enormous size, way beyond what they should do. Now, he says the, the cryptid most likely to exist is the thylacine. Um, the thylacine is a creature, it looks a bit like a wolf, but it's actually not. It's, not, it, it's uh, an example of convergent evolution, because so, it occupies the same ecological niche, the same habitat as the wolf. It ends up looking like a wolf. This is a reason, incidentally, why I think aliens may look more like, like us than, I, than you might think, even though they develop in a completely different ecosystem. They may end up looking more like us than you think. Um, but the cryptid is, the, the, the thylacine was actually, or is actually, a um, not a placental mammal at all. It is a marsupial, so it's more closely related to the kangaroo. Um, they, uh, they used to live all over Australia, New Guinea, and places like that. Over the last few thousand years, they've been, they've been hunted to extinction. The last one died in 1936 in Tasmania. But he believes they still they're still there in Tasmania. He believes um, a lot of people have seen thylacines wandering around crypt um, Tasmania, and yeah, that's that'd be nice if it's still alive. Yeah, um, he um, he also talks. He's also tr um, tried to find Bigfoot, the Yeti, the Mongolian death worm. It sounds scary. It's actually something that's supposed to give electric shocks and spit poison and things like that. It's actually not that scary. He believes it's actually a kind of lizard. Um, but um, a snake-like legless lizard. But um, anyway, good, it's good, great here. Richard's Richard's a real character. He's a real, he's a real cool guy. He's he's a mad lad, you know, in the sort of cantankular sense. And I really like him. And it was very interesting talk. He's a good writer too. I've read one of his books. Um, he's got some more out. So that was Sunday's speakers. Well, uh, I'm home back in Oxford. The train journey was extraordinarily fast. No delays. I got when I got to Didcot, straight off one train, crossed the platform onto another. Um, so it's about as quick as a journey could be, and I'm pleased actually. As I said, I got a lot to do tonight, but you know I may actually have time to edit and upload this. It all depends. It depends, depends how easy it is to copy the damn files. That's the thing. Um, this experiment with 
my using my phone as a camera rather than have buying a specialist camcorder <coughs> I think has come to an end um, I will be getting a new camcorder soon I certainly found that the night we were sky watching in the pub garden last night it was it's just not quick enough on the draw it's just cumbersome it's but it's it's not it doesn't sit neatly in my hand it's not maneuverable it's not easy to focus it's not easy to train well, it auto focuses but it's not easy to train and to frame properly um the files i think are going to be again they're going to be quite large so uh, that's going to make editing more difficult i still don't know if they're even going to copy to my my desktop i might have to copy them to my laptop and then like uh, file share them or something which could take ages if that happens then i won't upload tonight oh it's a, never mind it's worth a try worth a try but i think it's worth me forking out forking out some money and getting a decent camcorder to replace the one i lost it's been a really really good conference i've really enjoyed it um lots of really interesting stuff new kind isn't it you know, it's, it's different from bases and pro it's more sort of level-headed it's more scientific it's more um it's more open it's a more open-minded i'll say it. it it covers a wider perspective of opinion um which i welcome um you know skeptics are nothing to be scared of they should be welcomed if they're well behaved you can learn from them you know i mean you you can entertain ideas without necessarily accepting them you can put your uh, and put your ideas to the test challenge yourself don't stay within an echo chamber and as i said previously you know the the more you do that the more secure you will be in your own beliefs the less likely you will be to uh to sort of cross the aisle and do a do a 180 and become a skeptic yourself <coughs> and uh yeah there's been there's been some good good talks interesting so a few technical problems on the technical side the technical side wasn't that good in terms of the displays i mean the the, the powerpoint and computer completely broke down at one point during, during becky smith's talk um again the people staying at the accommodation lots of technical problems with the accommodation which a lot of them were complaining about catering very substandard not enough staff on to deal with the crush at lunchtime the breaks weren't long enough the speeches weren't long enough i mean i'll, I'll say more about later but i think someone some of them really needed longer for their talks. Half an hour is not enough to get some of them in. But uh, the people were lovely. The organisers were great. Very welcoming. Very accommodating for me and my friends. And it was so good to see people. It was so good to see the Alan Michael, the Crafty Nihilist, and several other people I saw there. Uh, yeah, and I... I also picked up some very exclusive information about UFOs. Someone actually shared me some information, actually private information I can't divulge right now. I know, I'm not teasing you, mate. It's just, they said, Ben, like, look at this. And it was like something they'd been shared privately and it's like something that's not published yet. And if it's published, I'll let you know, but it's very interesting, very interesting indeed. <laughs> oh, it's time to, I say, go home for a few hours, get some sleep, then get up and go to Mablethorpe. I don't know if I'm going to do a video for Mabel Thorpe, but I might just... I think it's more like I'll make it audio only and put it on the Panwell radio. I'm kind of like at a point where I need to do a comments reply video next before I do anything else. So, because uh, the comments list is getting rather long. Thank you. So I might not upload this video for that reason anyway. But thank you all of you for watching her Panwell TV yet again. Hospital porters, pride and dignity, stop the new world order. And the leak is still going. Mm. Keep paying your keep paying your carbon tax, guys.